This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Four minutes after ten is the time and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. We will wade, I think, straight in this morning to some of the most fractious territory that we ever explore together. I refer, of course, to the continuing situation in the Middle East as Israel continues its... um, Bombardment, attacks, offences against the Palestinian people in Gaza, edging ever closer. In fact, I think most people would accept that the case for collective punishment has been made fairly powerfully, although it doesn't fall to us to reach any verdicts about that. And the comments from Joe Biden over the weekend that I think are really important. the, The problem is when so many people have been killed, that conversations about the future or about diplomacy or about politics or about philosophy can sometimes feel almost crass, can't they? If I I start talking to you about the damage that Netanyahu has done to Israel, it's reputational damage moving forward. And you would shout at me quite rightly, I think, that it is nothing compared to the damage that has been done to the Palestinian people. I wouldn't really have an argument to offer up, except that it that that it also matters. You can't claim that reputational damage to the to the nation of Israel is as important or as harrowing as fourteen thousand dead children on the Gaza Strip, and of course counting. But if you want peace in the Middle East, if you want these people to live in harmony, either in a in a in a two state solution or all living side by side. Um, At this point, I think if I said from the river to the sea, I'd be suspended from the Labour Party. I don't know if that's still the state of affairs, unless, of course, I was saying it as a member of Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud Party, um, in which case it would go absolutely uncriticised and unchallenged by the kind of British politicians quoted in the Daily Telegraph today as going after David Cameron now for not being unstinting in his support of what Israel is doing. I don't know if they used the word themselves or if the Telegraph has merely editorialized it, but that was a moment. There's two things I told you that were going to happen and I really, really wish that I'd been wrong. The first was that I told you eventually this will crystallize into unquestioning and unwavering support for anything that Israel does up to and including plausible war crimes. It kind of had to. After that first month, when we all used words like proportionate and disproportionate and self-defense, and we were policed very uh, robustly if we didn't add after every call for peace in Palestine or peace in Gaza, if we didn't add immediately, and also we desperately want to see the hostages released as well. It became like a sort of, almost like a purity check upon rhetoric, and and I'm not sure how helpful it was, but for the avoidance of any doubt, literally nobody sensible or decent who wants people in Gaza to stop being killed uh, doesn't also want Israeli hostages, however many are left, however many haven't now been killed by the Israeli bombardments, to be released. I thought goes without saying. Do you know what? I still think it goes without saying. But if people are determined to pretend that not saying it somehow speaks of a of a more significant issue, then I, I am happy to meet their pretenses head on and reflect repeatedly the obviousness that calling for peace entails calling for the release of hostages. But you've got 30,000 dead people now, 30,000 dead humans. And if it's crass to suggest that Israel has hurt itself in its pursuit of, what, vengeance or Hamas or perhaps both, um, then it's probably also crass to suggest that the release of hostages can balance out on some sort of sort of celestial scales the, the, the continuing killing of, of 14,000 children and counting. So... The two things I said to you would happen have happened now. The first was that eventually all of the... And I don't know what words are best to use here because I don't know who really takes offence at this. Uh, If anyone knows how easy it is for people to take offence at at, at 
a bloke on the radio being proved right about stuff, then it's me. But I don't know how you can take offence at this. Is that in the immediate aftermath of that disgusting attack on October the 7th, the case that Israel must do something and could perhaps do anything was pretty hard to resist. But it became clear pretty quickly that the hopes of a proportionate response were rash, were vain, and that Netanyahu was hell-bent upon a course that would please some of the members of his own cabinet, uh, including, you know, at least one cabinet minister who's been convicted effectively of, of, of terrorist support. In order to keep them sweet, he would flirt with the kind of characters that were saying we should drop a nuclear bomb on the Gaza Strip or we should raise it to the ground or we should <clears throat> eradicate all of them. So... The, the, the notion that it would be in any way measured or stinting or proportionate seemed to disappear fairly quickly. Seemed to disappear fairly quickly. And what replaces it? Well, you have two choices at that time. You, you either do what I do, which is uh, uh, adjust your attitude as the facts change. Well, ask the questions like, how many dead is too many? Ask the questions like, where do they go? Ask the questions like, what is the uh, uh, end game? And realize that in the absence of proper answers to those questions, you have to change your attitude. You have to change your attitude. Or you don't change your attitude. That's option two. And if you don't change your attitude, if you, then you move from saying it must be proportionate, it must be measured, it is justified, it's self-defense. And then you watch what's happened subsequently, and you know it's none of those things. You have to, and, and this I think is, is where... A lot of the, the, the media machinations coming out of Israel have been very successful. You have to go to a place where you say they can do whatever they want. Israel can do whatever, whatever they want. Netanyahu can do whatever he wants. The cause is sufficiently just. The grievance is sufficiently great. The, 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 the wound is sufficiently raw to justify Benjamin Netanyahu killing an unspecified number, or, or, or rather his, the army that answers to him, killing an unspecified number of Palestinian people. And I don't think you can argue with me yet about the obviousness of that being where we are now. We, we, we are now divided. Those of us who have an interest in the issue, whether we have skin in the game or not, we are now essentially divided between... Uh, uh, well, anybody who recognized the necessity and rectitude of Israel responding robustly and militarily to the terror attack of... Um, of last October, it, we are now divided into two camps, aren't we? We are now divided into you can go too far and you have versus you can't go too far, so you won't. That's, that's it, right? That you, you either accept that Israel can go too far and almost certainly has, or you argue that Israel cannot go too far. And that takes us back to late October of 2023, when callers would ring in and balk almost at the question of how many deaths is too many deaths. And I don't know about you, but my goodness me, I heard the echoes, I heard that question resonating through, through my mind when I heard Joe Biden's comments this weekend. Remember that question that, that I think became a really pivotal point in our pondering of these issues our conversations about these issues how many dead is too many is it 10,000 is it 20,000 is it is it 200,000 how many dead is too many dead at what point does the world turn around and say enough and now listen to Joe Biden this weekend what's happening is he has a right to defend Israel a right to continue to pursue Hamas, but he must, he must, he must pay more attention to the innocent lives being lost as a consequence of the actions taken. He's hurting, in my view, he's hurting Israel more than helping Israel by making the rest of the world, it's contrary to what Israel stands for. And I think it's a big mistake. So I want to see a ceasefire. And there it is, really. Um, Biden concluding that 30,000 is too many. There's another clip I saw at the weekend where he actually said he can't kill another, thir or, or they can't kill another 30,000 people. So 30 minutes after 10 is the time. That was the second thing I told you that would happen, in that partly because of Netanyahu's personality and partly because of his political jeopardy, the damage eventually being done, or the damage is too mild a word, isn't it? But the, but the deaths in Gaza would eventually start damaging Israel on the world stage. 
Um, and I think that's happened now. We, we, we've, we've, we've touched on this already together. And it is one of those subjects where I, I can upset everybody and nobody at the same time. But when I tell you, as I told you right at the very beginning, no one is going to make me care more about a dead Israeli than I do about a dead Palestinian. And nobody's going to make me care more about a dead Palestinian than I do about a dead Israeli. And I appreciate how furious that makes some people feel, how obvious it is to some people that Israeli lives are worth less than Palestinian lives or that Palestinian lives are worth less than Israeli lives. And I'm carefully not bringing religion into it, although you've probably heard it uh, silently spoken anyway. But I refuse. I'm not joining that game. However desperate the importuning may be, however vile the insults may be, I do not care more about a dead Israeli than I do about a dead Palestinian. And I do not and will never care more about a dead Palestinian than I do about a dead Israeli. And if you want peace, if you want peace then you want Israel to be respected and even perhaps revered on the world stage. And my fear is, like Joe Biden's, that Benjamin Netanyahu has now done more harm to the Israeli cause, generationally speaking, moving forward, than I believed on October the 7th, perhaps naively, was even possible. So that's the question for you. Do you know what I mean? would be really nice and is almost certainly impossible is to hear from people who didn't have opinions, never mind strong opinions, didn't really know what was going on, knew nothing of the history of, well, that's a little bit naive. You must have known something. But who, if we were to go back to the 8th of October of last year, people who didn't have an emotional investment in either peoples, the Israeli people or the Palestinian people. I, I, don't, I mean a sort of form of impartiality, a lack of bias, a, a sort of perhaps just built upon um, a, a lack of engagement, a lack of understanding. So people who, whose, whose knowledge of the broader issue has grown with every passing month. Because I think that the, 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 the test of whether Joe Biden is right... The test of whether Joe Biden is right and Netanyahu is now damaging, is now hurting Israel. The test is really in the minds of the people who, who didn't have, people like me, actually, who didn't have uh, a, a, an entrenched support, in quotes, for either side, in quotes, at the beginning of this, who recognized the abhorrence of the Hamas terror attack. And who felt that there was a line over which Benjamin Netanyahu could, could subsequently go. And I think he's gone. I think he's gone way past it. 10,000 people protesting his resignation, wanting him to go on the streets of Tel Aviv this weekend. And more arrests there, I think, than there were among the reported 400,000 people protesting for peace on the streets of London. I, I mean, and, and yet, of course, the Conservative government remains committed to the idea that the protests on the streets of London are the major problem in the, in the current context. So 17 minutes after 10 is the time. Is Joe Biden right? And has his, and, and listen, I'm, I'm by no means excluding you if you've got strong views on this and have had strong views from the start, but I will find you just more interesting if they are capable of changing a bit. Is, is Joe Biden right? Has Netan, is Netanyahu now, with the obvious caveat that reputational damage is not as serious or as profound as death, whether it's the 1,200 killed on October the 7th or the, or the 30,000 and growing killed since in Gaza, but is Joe Biden right that Israel's, uh, what would the word be, policies, Israel's policies, Israel's maneuvers, have, have damaged Israel in the eyes of the rest of the world. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 6060 973. And just to, to not, not necessarily keep things light, um, we, we'd like to thank George 
for um, telling him, telling us, well, telling me in a text to 84850. It may even be a WhatsApp that, that it is a, a waste of time pretending that I don't have entrenched support for Israel. And I'd like to thank David for calling me anti-Semitic. So there are two people, George and David, who've listened to the same 15 minutes of radio that you've listened to. And one thing, one thinks that I am here shilling for the Israeli government, probably at the behest of my Jewish paymasters. Am I right? And the other thinks I'm anti-Semitic. So that's how I derive supreme confidence in the objectivity of my position. And from that objective position, I agree with Joe Biden. This is hurting Israel now. Do you agree with him? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Twenty three minutes after ten is the time, and and before we turn to your calls, a, a word perhaps from Jonathan Glazer, the director of uh, a film set in Auschwitz, based on Martin Amos's extraordinary novel, The Zone of Interest. Um, he accepted. The Oscar last night for um, Best International Film. First time Britain has won the prize. It's a German language film shot, I think, in Poland and based on a novel by the late, great Martin Amos. He, he is a Jewish man, a Jewish-British man, and he took to the stage with producer James Wilson. Um, I, 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 I think... The producer James Wilson has previously spoken about the dangers of selective empathy, as in something I just touched on a moment ago, the idea that you feel sorrier about one sort of death than you do about another. But it was the words of Jonathan Glazer that perhaps resonate most and, 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 and nudge us towards the question that I'm asking you about Joe Biden's comments over the weekend. Our film shows where dehumanisation leads at its worst. It shaped all of our past and present. Right now, we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people. Whether the victims of October the... <laughs> Whether the victims of October the 7th in Israel or the ongoing attack on Gaza, all the victims of this dehumanization, how do we resist? Alexandra Bistron Kaladziechek, the girl who glows in the film as she did in life, chose to. I dedicate this to her memory and her resistance. Thank you. Um, extraordinary words, but and and the Oscars are an enormous event on the world stage, and a and a Jewish British director there um, describing himself as refuting his Jewishness and refuting the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many people. So if you didn't know much about this before October the 7th, which he cites, whether the victims of October the 7th in Israel or the ongoing attack in Gaza, highlighting the importance, if not the ease, of feeling deaths from both populations with equal horror. So... Do you agree with Joe Biden that Israel, that Benjamin Netanyahu is now and has been for some time hurting Israel? Shayad's in Derby. Shayad, what would you like to say? Um, hi, James. Uh, I'd just like to add, I mean, this conflict's been going on for a number of years. And since October the 7th, if there's anybody that's really got a balanced view, um, it, it's yourself. And, and I really enjoy listening to your program and listening you. to your balanced view. Uh, but, but the thing is, Joe Biden's too little too late. Um, he should have said this right from the offset. What did he expect? That, you know, Israel's going to bomb Gaza and kill a thousand or fifteen hundred people and go back again. It's a complete atrocity. You know, yeah, I, I would... But you, can't, you can't, you can't, you can't... I, I, I... And this is, I, I mean, oddly now, it's a retrospective discomfort that, that you're prompting in me rather than a looking forward discomfort. So the question of how many deaths will be too many was, a, was felt like a crass question to ask, but an important one. But I now have to turn that on its head and ask you the opposite question is what did you expect Israel to do in response to October the 7th? Surely not nothing. No, absolutely. Uh, are they going to so respond? what would have been, not, not none of us then and none of us now probably can answer the question of what, what, what would have been proportionate, but we, but we know in our blood when it's not. It's weird that, isn't it? What, what would have been proportionate is if America took a stance many, many years ago, 
same with ourselves and actually try to resolve this conflict because, you know, war doesn't solve anything. History, you know... Well, it uh, did. It, it, it did, did many, many years ago. The, you know, the, the passage to peace that was being plotted by Yitzhak Rabin and others was done so with the full support of, of, of the West, of America. So it's not quite the same to but, say but, but, but what you say. What, what and also, exactly, you know I have to remind you that that's not the question that we're asking No, absolutely today. no. Absolutely. Now it's too little too late. Right. Um, I don't think what Biden or, 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 or Sunak can do is going to change anything. You know, it's 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 bleak. And until Netanyahu is in power, he's going to keep pounding. I don't think he's going to take anything on board uh, from from the UK or, or the US. So his position is not going to change. And I don't see it stopping. You know, it's 30,000 at the minute. It'll probably be 50,000. And what does what does because I, I think with respect, you, 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 you clearly had very strong views before the current upsurge in violence. Um, so you don't fit into that category of people who have no, for want of a better, don't have a dog in the race. But how does what does damage to Israel mean in the context that Joe Biden used it this weekend? Well, that, well, that, well that's new rhetoric coming from. No, but what from does it mean? US. Well, no, I know you're unhappy well, that he's I, I, done I, I, too little, honest, too late. I, I, but but I, I, what does it mean? I can't define that. Okay. James. Yeah, I can't define what that means because that is a major shift uh, in, in in U.S. rhetoric regarding Israel. You know. Um, I'd like to hear somebody define that, you know. Because well, well, well the, that's what we're asking. I thought you yeah, might be yeah, able to, the, 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 but we'll crack US on. <laughs> have given a free reign to Israel for far too long. And, and we find so, ourselves in that extraordinary situation at the end of last week of, of, of having a, a, a pier, a sort of de facto port being built in the sea alongside Gaza to, to get aid into a country that was being rendered in need of more and more aid by a bombardment or by military attacks, bombardments, whatever words you prefer, uh, undertaken due to the military support that the other side, uh, I, I don't know if it's a conflict anymore, really, in any meaningful sense of the word. There doesn't seem to be much fighting back from, from, from the people in Gaza. But the, the point is that Israel, America seeking to send aid in from one end and, and, and bombs in from the other, or at least aid and bombs with, with, a, with an American flag on them. Thank you, Shad. Stephen's in Glasgow. Stephen, what do you think? What would you like to say? Oh, hang on, mate. I just looked at the clock. I'll come to you the first half to the new... Oh, do you know what? I'll get the hang of this one day. How long has it been now? 20 years. We should probably have some sort of anniversary. I, one day I will get the hang of this. I'll learn to look at the clock before I look at the switchboard. Stephen will be up first after the news. Before we go there, I'll just, I'll just read you this, because you probably think I exaggerate stuff. This is from Ben. He says, James, you are a clever guy, and you have put it very eloquently and delicately, but what you fear to say is that the USA is controlled by Jews, and so is the UK. You know it, but will not say it directly ever. Your job brings more benefits than any other, so why would you want to lose it? So just in case you think I exaggerate when I tell you how squarely the accusations come down between me being anti-Semitic from people like David and me being somehow in the, in the pocket of the secret world controllers uh, who all happen to be Jews, as Ben believes, they are listening to the same program that you're listening to. I, I, I sometimes worry that possibly I don't fully explain the... Uh, uh, sort of twin horrors of that situation to you. But the best way to do so is, of course, with examples. Here's Thomas Watts with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.35 is the time. Um, do you remember, who, who were our best Brexit commentators, Brexit contributors in the immediate aftermath of the referendum result? Kieran the van driver was uh, probably the most tireless because he spent so much time on the road. Uh, and he was telling us many years ago what the reality would be um, while people like Jacob Rees-Mogg were blowing unicorn fumes up your fundament. And he's been proved right about everything. A uh, story around the, today about how we're, we're still not ready for the checks we're going to have to bring in as a consequence of taking back control. But Andreas, my greengrocer friend, was also um, uh, uh, very front and centre and has been proved very prescient. Again, why would you listen to Jacob Rees-Mogg about the import and export of food more than you'd listen to someone in the business of importing and exporting? Sporting food it's a question for the ages uh, and he was quoted in the paper at the weekend I saw a photograph of him in his shop and everything but that is because he has become a sort of de facto spokesperson for the difficulties of British retailers getting in goods from continental Europe that they once received uh, frictionlessly to coin a phrase we'll be catching up with him shortly <clears throat> um, there, there is I don't know can you defect from no party to a party surely that's just that's just an any port in a storm situation, but the, the, such is the nature. Look, I'm going to point something out to you now with two quite odd examples. 
The first thing I'm going to point out to you is inspired by a text that came in from Stephen, which I almost certainly won't be able to find. But it was about being someone who doesn't really follow politics much. You were kind enough to suggest you started doing so when you started listening to this show a couple of years ago. The October the 7th atrocity happened and you thought, crikey, Israel's going to have to do something. And now you sit watching what Israel is doing and you think this is terrible for Israel. This is, this is reputational damage on, a, on an epic scale. Um, and, and I'm having a conversation today essentially from a position that everybody knows a lot about this and cares deeply. Because you get messages accusing you of anti-Semitism or accusing you of being um, in the pay of the Jewish lobby. You, 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 inevitably, you have an emotional investment in the subject matter. But I think that there is a danger when you do what I do for a living or when you write about politics of thinking that everything's really, really important to everybody when it isn't, even when it perhaps should be. And then there are the stories that the political establishment, the journalists, the commentators, they'll all be going mad for this today. In the great scheme of things, it's absolutely meaningless. A ridiculous human being called 30 Pence Lee Anderson is joining a ridiculous business which calls itself a political party led by a ridiculous man called Richard Tice. It is, if you like, a... Um, a cornucopia of ridiculousness, a festival of ridiculousness, ridiculous people, ridiculous people doing ridiculous things. And so desperate is the British media establishment for copy. And so secretly of a piece are they with the prejudices and bigotries of, of Nigel Farage, who has some role in the party that Richard Tice leads that I don't really understand. He's probably, I don't know, he probably looks after the bank book or something like that. So that, there, that today will be presented to you as an enormous story because one of them who doesn't currently have a political party after engaging in base Islamophobia regarding the uh, British politician who routinely faces the highest levels of security threat than any other politician in the United Kingdom, 30p Lee Anderson decided to give him a little bit more Islamophobic abuse. He gets slung out of the Conservative Party and lo and behold, he finds a home in Nigel Farage's party which is led by this bloke Tice. And that's the big story of the moment. In fact, they've just wheeled him onto the stage, looking like an overinflated plum, while Richard Tice stands next to him, looking like a sort of second-rate market trader or fairground barker. So don't make the mistake today of thinking that this is about anything other than an out-of-control ego cr cr crashing headlong into a single-figure IQ. But we may talk about it shortly. 10.39 is the time. Back to the question. Oh, and I've got more news for you. Hands up if you give a flying fig about what Kensington Palace have had to say about the fact that a photograph of Kate Middleton with her children that was issued yesterday was manipulated. Go on, hands up. Even I went down a bit of a rabbit hole last night. Why on earth, when you're desperately trying to prove that there's nothing to see here and all of the mad conspiracy theories that people have come up with regarding Kate Middleton's disappearance from public life for the last two months are mad conspiracy theories, why on earth would you put out a photograph that had been digitally manipulated so egregiously that the major... The, I mean, I'm just going to say this. The world's major picture agencies issued a kill notice. They said, we cannot use this picture. We are, not, we are withdrawing it from circulation because it's been manipulated. And the Princess of Wales, which is Kate Middleton, has now issued a statement on Instagram, like a kind of... Also, she signs it C. I, 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 I might start signing all my things, J. She signs it C. And the statement is this. So hold on to your hats. Like many amateur photographers, I do occasionally experiment with editing. I wanted to express my apologies for any confusion the family photograph we shared yesterday caused. I hope everyone celebrating had a very happy Mother's Day. So the world's major picture agencies last night took the unprecedented step of pulling a photograph from public circulation, a story that regardless of what you feel about the royal family will have resonated at almost every level of international journalism. And... This lady has responded it to it by saying, sorry, I was just, I was just faffing around on Photoshop. Merry Christmas. I, 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 there, are some stories that, there are some stories that leave me wondering whether I actually know what's going on in the world. And that is one of them. Rather more importantly, what is going on in Gaza, in particular in the Middle East in general, is, it has been suggested by the leader of the free world, Joe Biden, is now doing more harm to Israel than... Um, 
uh, than ever before. And I wonder whether you agree. Stephen's in Glasgow. Stephen, what would you like to say? Morning, James. Hello, nice to speak to you again. Likewise. Um, yeah, I'm one of that demographic you were looking for. I've got no dog in the race whatsoever. Um, even to the degree that October the 7th was what prompted me to look into Israel-Palestine. I'm 45 okay. years old. Yes. And rather shamefully, probably knew very limited information about it. Um, October the 7th really prompted me to, to have a look at it. And you realise very, I think when you're a child, you grow up and you're told about the goodies and the baddies. Yes. And it's only when you get to kind of adult age that you start to realise there's a lot more nuance in it and there's a lot more to it than that. Almost and for always. Me, always. Mm. And reading about Israel and Palestine becomes very, very complicated and it takes a long time to get your head around it. For me now, I think Biden hit the nail on the head. I think he's absolutely right. We're, we're now at a stage, and I'm not saying I'm not going to categorise anyone as being goodies or baddies, no. but, but Israel is falling, or Netanyahu is in danger of bringing Israel into the category where the world is starting to really ask questions and really starting to say, is this revenge or is this retribution? And I think for me, the fundamental difference between the definition of both those words mm. is is what the problem is. More people are now starting to look at it as revenge as opposed to retribution, which by definition has inherent limits, inherent limits and is directed at wrongdoing. And the problem with, obviously, Hamas and, and the invisible nature of Hamas is where is the end for this? And if you're going to go into a conflict like this, and I think you asked the question way back in October, what what is the end goal here? Yeah. And... I think what it, I don't think I actually don't think if you were to ask Benjamin Netanyahu truthfully to answer that I don't think he could give you a truthful answer. No, I think he could actually, and I think he's come pretty close over the years. And 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 some of the people he's put in the cabinet in order to keep his political position have come even closer in recent months. In that they they would essentially drive everybody out of the Gaza Strip and 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 move in. I think in, I, yeah. I mean, you know whether he would explicitly say that my conviction is that that is his conviction it's the only yeah, theory so. that fits with the with the with the self preservation trumping everything else laid to one side for a moment it's the only theory that fits the event yeah i think i think you could be right but like we said the the, the problem we have is not only the reputation of israel but the reputation of the, the feeling of fear amongst jewish people throughout the world created by by some of these actions as well there'll, there'll be jewish people throughout the world who feel hated feel victimized because of the actions of i, I think I, i've and, said for some people. time they must that they're almost the loneliest people in the whole saga absolutely are the people who will be on the receiving end of anti-semitism as a, a completely unfair and unjustified response to the actions of the state of israel or the liquid government or benjamin netanyahu um, who also disapprove of what is being done. 10,000 people on the streets of Tel Aviv last night calling for Netanyahu to go on, on Saturday night, sorry. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I think I, I really worry about the dangers of one person's ego. And we've, we've seen how history teaches us about that. Well, all the and worst things, I think, in history. Uh, uh, yeah, it's really nicely put, actually. All the worst things in history arguably happen of uh, 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 as a consequence of, of one person's ego at uh, 10 it's coming up to quarter to 11 you're listening to james o'brien on lbc um joe biden's just right on this and and I, I, again you know as with Stephen, the people you feel sorriest for are probably people who will suffer from no the people you feel sorriest for are the grieving whether they're israelis or whether they're palestinians the people you feel sorriest for are the grieving families and friends the people you feel sorriest about are the dead I, I, there is a hierarchy of suffering here, but some of the people I feel very sorry for include people who will be on the wrong end of a, a disgusting and utterly unjustifiable, idiotic, like our friend there, Ben, claiming that I'm frightened of saying out loud that the Jews rule the world. I, you know, that level of anti-Semitism will be directed at all Jews, regardless of what they think about Benjamin Netanyahu or the killings in Gaza. So you, you, you lose on both fronts, as it were. You, you don't have the solidarity, if that's the right word to use, of, of Israeli um, uh, certainty. And neither do you have the support of... Um, or neither... Uh, uh, yeah, neither do you have immunity from the, the disgusting anti-Semitic attacks that are born of ignorance and, uh, uh, and hatred of what is being done today. 
in Israel's name. And of course, born of millennia, centuries of, of prejudice and hatred, generational hatred. It's, a, it's just a mess. And Biden's right. And I, I, if you want to tell me that he's wrong, you know the number, 03456060973. Um, I may take some calls from Ashfield. I, I can't quite imagine what it's like to be represented by this gristle um, in human form, Lee Anderson. What's it like to have gristle as your MP? Uh, I, may, I don't know, but you've got to be in Ashfield to answer that question, I think. Um, but after this, we're going to have a look at what Brexit has done to people, shopkeepers. Yeah, we used to be a nation of shopkeepers. That's what Napoleon said, isn't it? Oh, no, I beg your pardon. That's going to be in the next hour. We're going to have a conversation. So after this, we'll get back to this. There you go. I told you I'd get the hang of this one day. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 10.51. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Joe Biden has spoken um, rather persuasively and impressively, actually, the State of the Union address and, and, and subsequently. The man is old and uh, and quite fragile. Similar age, I think, possibly even the same age as Bernie Sanders, who I had the great pleasure of interviewing a couple of weeks ago. And and Bernie Sanders is not fragile in the same way that, that, that Biden is. Um, but then again, if the alternative is Donald Trump, you'd take fragile any day of the week, unless you're a massive racist. Uh, which reminds me, Lee Anderson's just defected to the Reform Party, although I'm not sure... But can you defect if you don't actually have a party to start with? Surely that's just a bit like getting on the first bus that pulls up at the bus station. But I may find out what it's like for the good voters of Ashfield to be represented by Gristle. Uh, do you want to know something funny about snowflakes? So you'll be familiar with 30p Lee abusing the mayor of London in a profoundly Islamophobic way, essentially accusing him of being a terrorist sympathiser, despite knowing, as he surely would, as a former deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, that Sadiq Khan um, regularly endures higher levels of security threat from both the far right and from Islamists than any other politician in this country. Uh, but, but me calling Anderson Gristle has upset a couple of texters. They're very upset. John and Rick, they're called. They're very upset about me calling a politician Gristle, but not upset at all about that politician describing another elected uh, British politician in Islamophobic, deeply racist and very dangerous terms. Isn't that funny, isn't it? I bet they use the word snowflake as a pejorative as well. So for the avoidance of doubt, Lee Anderson is Gristle. He is, he is Gristle in human form, but he is also now the MP for Ashfield and a member of the Reform UK Limited Company. What a wonderful, what a time to be alive. As is in Forest Hill, to steer us back to the rather more important matters of the Middle East. As, what would you like to say? Uh, James, good morning. How are you? Very well. Wow, you've got a deep voice. <laughs> Thank you. You're very um, welcome. Yeah, this um, your, your initial question is is is, is, is he doing more harm re- to Israel now than than almost anything? Rhetorical, well, well the, uh, unquestionably, the un- un- well, I say unfortunate, but the, the unquestionable answer is yes. Now, as to should we be taking what Joe Biden says as evidence of the fact that he's had a political shift in his language? Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, because I speak to a lot of African Americans, I don't really take his position because he could have said this a long time ago, and as yeah. you said earlier. At the same same time as them uh, continuing to supply them with military arms and and weaponry, they're now starting to send some aid, which, of course, I'm sure you've seen some of the aid, the parachutes didn't open, and that aid actually killed some Palestinians. It's too awful to even think. It's just so twilight zone. You're you're sending bombs and you're sending aid, and both are killing them. It's beyond belief. So, as you said again, just before the break, Mr. Netanyahu knows what he's doing. He's not going to listen to Joe Biden and he would actually prefer Donald Trump to be back in office. This is the backdrop in order to understand the precarious position that Joe Biden is in. So on the one hand, everybody's seen and heard what, you know, the next potential president has said already uh, in relation to Muslims and talking about Mr. Trump. And we saw in Michigan, the uncommitted voters 100,000, and it was projected to be maybe 10,000. It was upwards of 100,000 people who voted uncommitted for Joe Biden in the primaries. So this is the backdrop. So, Do you know, you know I, I'm, say, I'm, I'm pushing back a bit on this, and I know I'm naive, but I, 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 they're, they're, <laughs> pendulums are helpful. 
right? And and wrongly, probably wrongly, Biden could have moved further much sooner. And the backdrop, the historical backdrop to this is an almost unstinting support for Israel, while a fig leaf of material support through aid for, for Gaza has been in place for years. It's, it's more than a fig leaf if you're there, but in terms of international relations and perceptions, it, 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 it does seem hypocritical to be providing one side with arms and the other side with flour. But, exactly. No, and, and, I take, exactly. and I take all of that. I do understand all of that. I also understand the historical necessity of safeguarding the existence of Israel, uh, almost the prioritizing of that above everything else in the region. I understand that intellectually, I'm not here to have the moral argument. And in that context, there comes a point where post October the 7th, you are supportive of Israel's response until you are not. And I do believe that he has sincerely reached that point where he is not. I don't think he's doing it because of electoral, domestic electoral calculations, and I don't think he's doing it cynically. I, and I, you can certainly tell me he should have done it sooner, and I wouldn't argue with you today, but I don't think he's doing it dishonestly. He has reached the point where he can no longer support the response. And I thought the earlier caller distinguishing between retribution and revenge probably pinned it down perfectly. Well, in that context, then, James, you'd have to say then, if he now has reached a position where it's now his position has changed, yeah. what is he doing in order to back up his rhetoric? Well, he's, 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 well, well no, he's, 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 he's speaking usual. very robustly, both privately and publicly, and sometimes somewhere between the two, given the nature yes, of roving this, this microphones. And he's putting the port on the on the seafront he's building the, the the port i mean it seems odd it seems almost sort of worthy of jonathan swift as you've pointed out sending in a flower from one end and ordinance from the other but he is doing a hell of a lot more this month than he did last month and again that's not an opinion that's just counting now that is counting but what happens then if after building this new facility to do whatever they think it's going to do what yep. happens if they suddenly friendly fire and the israelis destroy it then what then you're going to be into another we've got enough to deal with without hypotheticals yeah, exactly. however however complex they yeah, may be exactly. but in your own words I, I, for someone who is unpersuaded that netanyahu is damaging israel either because they cannot see israel as ever going too far or ever doing wrong and we know there are plenty of people in that category both inside and outside the country the nation of israel that to, to to persuade them that netanyahu is damaging israel you would say what oh well you just have to look at the the, the, the israelis who are protesting on a regular basis to have him removed from office and well, they were doing that can. before october the 7th to be god i'm in that mood again today i do apologize but they were doing no, that before no. october the 7th this is the anti netanyahu movement that lost exactly. traction after october the 7th i'd probably point to the international court in in the hague or something like that as, as well as and, and therefore we have to then take a look at what south africa are doing again they've referred yeah. to israel for the second time and if you listen to what the, the uh, foreign minister says, Dr. Naladi Pandor says, any South African who has gone to Israel to fight alongside the idea, when they return to South Africa, they are going to be arrested. So this is where the moral... And, 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 and that is why the British and American public are perhaps being rather let down by their media or by our media, because we're not getting anything like the same pictures reports that that you would be getting in other countries uh, because you would probably be shocked at where both international public opinion lay on this and also domestic public opinion domestic public opinion has, has for some time been swimming violently against the tide of of conservative party policy and let's be fair Keir Starmer's not that far behind conservative party policy although he's put some clear blue water in there subsequently um it, it is a, a frankly tragic tragic state of affairs and one in which I make no apology for feeling sorry for the Israeli people being so profoundly let down on a generational scale by Benjamin Netanyahu. Thank you, Ad. James O'Brien on LBC. I, I, I think I'm going to give myself a little pat on the back for trusting my instincts on that story about the photograph from, from Kensington Palace. I just couldn't get worked up about it. Even after the... Uh, international press agencies pulled it i just thought it's it's just unlikely to be my goodness me those rabbit holes are fascinating though i just can't quite see it but oddly they have achieved the impossible in that they have made me wonder whether there is something more serious going on because their response to the mess has been so pathetic culminating today in that the princess of wales 
uh, posting on Twitter, like many amateur photographers, I do occasionally experiment with editing. I wanted to express... You don't experiment with editing on a photograph that, oh, I'm doing it again. I start off saying I'm not interested in something, and then the more I talk about it, the more interested I get. That's why, I think mean, that is why I've got this job. I start, I'm, I'm about to do it with 30p, Lee. I bet you 10, I bet you 10 pence. No, actually, let's get it topical. I bet you 30 pence. I bet you 30 pence that when I've finished explaining why I'm not remotely interested in Kate Middleton's ph photography skills, I will move on to it and, and end up interested in it. I'll move on to explaining why I'm not remotely interested in 30 pence Anderson defective, re infecting to the Reform UK company. Uh, and by the end of that, I will actually be quite interested in it. So what you can't do is say, oh, I'm just experimenting with some editing. I'm just messing around on Photoshop. You can't do that if the photograph is designed to dispel claims and criticisms that there is some mad conspiracy afoot at the palace to explain why you haven't been seen in public for months. The one thing, what you do then is you do, you, first of all, you get in a proper photographer to do it straight down the barrel with absolutely no room for quibbling or, 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 or problems whatsoever. And then you put it out utterly undoctored, un, unmanipulated and untouched. That, there you go, you can have that for nothing. If people charge thousands of pounds for this sort of crisis comms advice and PR. You do not, when you're issuing a photograph designed to dispel rumours that there's something dodgy going on, you do not deploy dodgy technology to manipulate the photograph that you are issuing in order to dispel rumours that there is something dodgy going on. Thank you very much. That's the end of my TED talk. And now to... Uh and now to now and now to 30p Lee Anderson, who I, I believe is still talking at the press conference to which we we now cross live. So you don't think that Richard Tice has got the minerals to be a proper politician? I, I don't. I don't think he is a proper dish. Uh, it, it, like I say, uh, Patrick, I think he's a pound shop, um, Nigel Farage, and every time he opens his mouth recently um, on, on what, which other media platform, he, he's, he's coming across as the the reforms answer to Diane Abbott. I'm sorry, that, that's from a few couple, what, yesterday? A, f a few weeks, I don't know. That's before he, they put him on the payroll. That was him talking about the bloke who ostensibly leads this limited company that is ostensibly a political party before he got put on the payroll. He is, he is now on the payroll, um, and this is him speaking now that he's on. So when he wasn't on the payroll, uh, Tice was a, a pound shop Farage, who uh, who didn't have a proper political party? You're going to be, if this is not a proper political party, by the way. This is a company. So 30p Lee Anderson, not on the payroll of Reform UK Limited, says this is not a political party. By the way, it's a company. Um, I, I, I would say he's not Nigel Farage. That, do you know by Lee Anderson standards that counts as a clever observation? He's absolutely right. Richard Tice is not Nigel Farage. Well done, Lee. Well done, mate. Seriously, that's that's progress. He is definitely not Nigel Farage. Neither is he uh, Christopher Biggins. You could have said that as well. He's definitely not Christopher Biggins. Well done, Lee. Seriously. In fact, if you just did a long list of people that Richard Tice is not, no one could fault you for being wrong, could they? So when he wasn't on the payroll, he said he's, 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 just, he's just not Nigel Farage. Um, he's a pound shot Nigel Farage. Fast forward to this morning, 30p Lee is now on the payroll. And this is what he's got to say. And we'll start by saying, I want my country back. Over the last year or so, I've had to do a lot of soul searching on my political journey. And it was laughing. And I don't expect much in politics other than to be able to speak my mind. Who's laughing? Bloody everybody, mate. Um, at least... I mean, say what you like about the lad. No one can fault his loyalty. You seem quite crestfallen, Lee. I am. I'm, I'm gutted, mate, to be honest with you. It's not a nice thing to do to, to watch your mates go into one lobby and you go into the other. Like I said, I went into the no lobby to, to rebel. This is, this is the key word at the moment. But when I, once I saw the Labour lot, Labour lot sniggling and taking the mate, I thought, you know what? Well, haven't you got, you got a thick skin, Lee Anderson? Got, Come I on, have, I've seen you go toe-to-toe to -to -to with the left, yeah, left of the... Of of the, of the, of the but at the end of the day, my mates are going in one lobby and I'm in another and they're taking the... And Tell us you them. what they were saying then. They were just sniggling and pointing and laughing. Oh, Leander's in there. We, you know, he's coming back to the Labour Party and all this. I saw that. I thought, you know what? Off. Um, mm. um, um, it's, like, it's like the playground antics. It is. It's playground politics. 
Well, this is a strange old business, isn't it? So, first of all, he claimed that he couldn't rebel against the bill that he resigned as deputy chairman of the Conservative Party to rebel against, because when he went into the lobby to rebel against it, people started sniggling at him, and he remembered how good the people in the Conservative Party had been to him, because they are now his mates, and he didn't really want to betray his mates by voting against the bill that he resigned as deputy chairman of the Conservative Party to vote against, and they were his mates. And, and, and that's why he didn't do the thing that he said he was going to do when he did the thing that he did in order to do the thing that he said he was going to do because they were his mates. They were his mates. But he's left them now. Um, oh, I suppose he got pushed, didn't he, before he could jump. But that he somehow managed to defect from no party at all to a, a party that he described in the following terms just a few days, weeks, who cares? I mean, this is when he wasn't on the payroll. So you don't think that Richard Tice has got the minerals to be a proper politician? I don't. I don't think he is a proper dish. Uh, like I say, uh, Patrick, I think he's a pound shop, um, Nigel Farage. And every time he opens his mouth recently um, on, on whichever media platform, he, he's, he's coming across as the the reforms answer to Diane Abbott. And now he is indeed on a reforms platform, standing next to Richard Tice. And all that's changed, as far as I can tell, is that 30p is now on the payroll. And we'll start by saying, I want my country back. Over the last year or so, I've had to do a lot of soul searching on my political journey. And it was laughing. And I don't expect much in politics other than to be able to speak my mind someone should really explain to him how the whip works shouldn't they or, or indeed sort of collective responsibility or party politics or manifestos uh and and finally i suppose a, a quick word on how much loyalty his new colleagues in the reform limited company something farage what's it can expect from their new member 30p lee you seem quite crestfallen, Lee. I am. I'm, I'm gutted, mate, to be honest with you. It's not a nice thing to do to, to watch your mates go into one lobby and you go into the other. Like I said, I went into the no lobby to, to rebel. This is, this is the key word at the moment. But when I, once I saw the Labour lot, Labour lot sniggling and taking the mate, I thought, you know what? Well, haven't you got, you got a thick skin, Lee Anderson? Got, Come I, on, I've seen you uh, go toe-to-toe-to-toe to, 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 to with the left, yeah, left of, the, of, the, of the... Chopper, but at the end of the day, my mates are going in one lobby and I'm in another and they're taking the... And Tell smaller. us you what they were saying then. They were just sniggling and pointing and laughing. Oh, Leander's in there. We, you know, he's coming back to the Labour Party and all this. I saw that. I thought, you know what? Off. Um, 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 it's, like, it's like the playground antics. It is. It's playground politics. What a turnip, honestly. It's quite extraordinary. And, of course, the only thing he used to be known for... I, don't, I still don't know if there's a phone in here. I, I, I enjoyed my sort of cliptastic tours of recent history. It is, frankly, extraordinary that you can move, when you're not on the payroll, from sticking the boot in to the entire operation to joining it when, when, when you are on the payroll, despite your mates in the party you've been chucked out of for Islamophobia and racism. I mean, I mean who, who here? Who here can contain their shock that a politician chucked out of a proper party for Islamophobia and racism ending up in the same outfit as Nigel Farage. I, it's absolutely staggering, isn't it? It's extraordinary. But, of course, the only thing he was ever known for was, was a, a remarkable exchange on the streets of Ashfield when he engaged in political dishonesty that would once have ended his candidacy. If, if this had happened in Keir Starmer's Labour Party, they'd have done what they did in Rochdale. Anderson wouldn't have been able to stand as a Labour candidate, which he was actually trying to do a few weeks before he became a Conservative candidate. He was allegedly, uh, he allegedly failed in his attempts to become a Labour district councillor after making sexist comments at the selection interview. Who here can contain their shock at the fact that a man who allegedly failed to become a district councillor in a proper political party has ended up in the same outfit as Nigel Farage? after allegedly making sexist comments at the selection. But, I mean, it's just a poor old Nigel. How does he always end up attracting? What is it that attracts flies? What's the thing? I can't... There's a figure of speech. You, you, you leave it in the middle of your lawn and then loads of flies will land. What is it about Nigel Farage that keeps attracting flies? Like Lee Anderson. Extraordinary, really. But anyway, there we are. Because this, to me... And I am, if, you're, if, you've, if you've detected a note of ebullience in my mood this morning, it is for two reasons. Number one is I think the man's hilarious for all the wrong reasons. I mean, to the point where he actually stands there and goes, who's laughing? Everybody's laughing, Lee. 
Uh, and the second thing is, when I was writing the new chapter for my book, the paperback's out on April the 25th, I had to choose a politician who hadn't featured much in the hardback, but who kind of summed up how awful things had become under Rishi Sunak. And guess who I chose? This clown. I've never known an encounter quite like this one. This week, Anderson sparked national controversy with a video calling for antisocial council tenants to be kept under a tough regime in tents. My plan would be, and again, this is just my own personal opinion, is that these people who have to live somewhere, let's have them in a tent in the middle of a field. Hiya. Hiya. I'm Lee Anderson, your parliamentary candidate for the Conservative Party. How are you doing? Hello. I recognise you. It's, it's Steve, isn't it? Yeah, I recognise you. How are you doing, mate? All right. Yes, I'm Just doing fine. a bit of last-minute campaigning. Um, are you going to be voting oh, on definitely. December the 12th? And do you definitely. mind me asking which way you're going to go this time? Well, I'm going to be up. There's you're no going. way Labour are ever going to get my vote again. And he liked Mr Anderson's very personal policy initiative this week. <laughs> I watched that video. Yeah. What do you mean, uh, putting uh, antisocial people in tents? Yeah, I didn't. He's I not think allowed he to talk about shocked. that now. I think you're a bit soft on it. But, a bit soft? Yeah. What would you do then? I'd give them cat and nine tails for. <laughs> cat and nine tails? Make them wear a pink tutu. Pink tutu? <laughs> that would stop them going around bullying anybody. What about that? I can't support. I can't support this. Can can we just cut there for one moment, please? You can't support the cat of nine <laughs> yeah, tails. No, I can't support that. I can't support that. Set up well more than I'd realised. For it was only after Lee Anderson had left us that my cameraman producer had the chance to tell me that because Anderson was wearing one of our radio microphones, we'd managed to record him setting up the apparently spontaneous doorstep encounter beforehand. Watch. And listen, you can just see Anderson on the phone behind me. Don't just make out you, you don't, don't make out you know who I am. You know I'm the candidate, but not a friend. All right. Uh, I'm out at Staff Car Park. Have a quick look. Yeah. All right, my daughter. I'll see you in a minute. See you, mate. At the time, Anderson said the call was merely about campaign material. All right, better turn this off. Some leaflets have just come for me. So, in all my years filming elections. I've long suspected that certain candidates have set up friendly voters to make them look that much more popular. But this is the first time we've caught some candidate blatantly in the act. I am I'm 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 just hearing that in 2020 Lee Anderson voted for the recall of MPs change of party affiliation bill which means that if you do defect if you leave the party that you were elected as a member of, as an MP, then you would immediately call a by-election. So I presume that... that What? Hello? No? Oh, no. Uh, he's just told the BBC's political editor, Chris Mason, that he won't be calling a by-election. Well, this is all very awkward. That footage that I just played you was him setting up a doorstep interview with an apparent constituent, but doing it in profoundly dishonest fashion by saying, I'm about to knock on your door. Pretend that, you, pretend that we're not mates. Uh, even when... He had fraudulently set up a doorstep interview with a mate who had been instructed to pretend that they weren't mates. Even then it went badly. Even then the fellow was so right-wing, he started coming out with stuff about bringing back the cat of nine tails and making offenders march around in pink tutu. So even when he's trying to organise a fraudulent encounter with a voter, such as 30p Lee Anderson's political acumen, that it goes wrong. Look, if something goes wrong on the doorstep when you've knocked on a random door and it's been opened by someone over whom you have absolutely no control whatsoever, you could chalk that up as an occupational hazard. But if you've gone to the trouble of ringing your mate to say, I'm about to ring your doorbell, pretend we're not mates, because I've got this bloke here from the telly, Michael Crick. So you've gone to that trouble, you've set up a fraudulent encounter on the doorstep, and even that's gone wrong. Even that's gone badly. <sighs> I don't think I've I got. Have we got a phone in here? Is there a phone in here? Is there a phone in here? I mean, John makes a Johnny makes a point. He's a, who's laughing? He says, "My God, I can't believe where our nation is. It's quite incredible, James. But I could actually cry, and not from sniggling." Now I'm with you. I have the therapeutic benefit of having written a whole book about how we've ended up in this mess. But is there a phone in? in how how has British politics that once gave the world Winston Churchill? Margaret Thatcher, if you like that sort of thing. Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, Michael Heseltine. Uh, the great statesman, the Israeli, Gladstone. How has British politics become a place where Lee Anderson now 
merits headlines and attention. A, a man who I honestly think would struggle to lace his own boots. It is quite extraordinary. Whether or not it's a phone-in, you can find out after this. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. I'm still not sure. I, I gave myself plenty of breathing space there, but I'm still not sure because I, I'll tell you what my problem is. No, only one in this very specific context. We haven't, we haven't got all day. I'll tell you what my problem is. My problem is that I do not know whether 30p Lee is just a very uh, uh, specific... What did they say about breaking international law? A very limited and specific politician. Do, do you see what I mean? Is, is he just an individual idiot? Gristle in human form. T turn it whatever you want to call him. Uh, don't be too rude. You know, don't be as rude as he was about Sadiq Khan. That stuff can be insightful. But uh, uh, just someone so... so the, the combination of ignorance and arrogance is an extraordinary cocktail. If you're very arrogant but not ignorant, you can achieve amazing things. If you're very ignorant and not arrogant, no one will ever know you exist. But if you're very ignorant and very arrogant, then the combination is utterly intoxicating. So this fellow wanders around with all the tact and intelligence of a tin of shoe polish, and he thinks he's a sort of political visionary. That, that, that's what I mean about not knowing. I don't know whether he is representative of a broader malaise or whether he is just a very extraordinarily awful human being. Do, do you see what I mean? And I think that might be a phone-in. I think that might be a phone-in. Is he simply a, a, a very specific moment, an extraordinary, awful individual, all right? Or is he evidence of a broader malaise? Now, I have to tell you, I've written a couple of thousand words for the paperback edition of my latest bestseller, uh, which is out on April the 25th, in which I do essentially portray him as evidence of a broader malaise but very much symptom not cause so how they broke britain is about the causes of our national catastrophe and it, it highlighted 10 people who were from three sections of society and who between them sometimes deliberately sometimes by accident had brought us unnecessarily to our knees the final chapter the new chapter and actually quite a lot of you asking so i will tell you that um the new chapter, if you've got the audiobook, I have had a conversation with my publishers and it will be free for everybody, whether you've bought the audiobook or not. I think I'm pretty sure we're going to release the new chapter audio read by me for everybody, whether, whether you've got it or not, because I didn't want people who'd bought the audiobook not to get the bonus chapter. If you bought the hardback, um, you can also listen to me reading the, the the bonus chapter, but you won't. You know, I can't send out pamphlets that you glue into the back like a sort of figurini panini album. But you should really go out and buy the paperback, even if you've got the hardback, because it's got an index in it, which means you can use it to win arguments with the gammon and the gristle in your life by simply going, "What was that thing James told me about Lee Anderson lying about a, a voter in Nashville? Oh, there it is. Yeah, there, page two hundred and sixty-six. So I have written quite a lot about how Anderson is. Uh, representative of how low the Tory party has gone under Rishi Sunak. So the, the, the book originally ended with Liz Truss effectively, but Rishi Sunak is the bonus chapter, chapter 11. And, and Lee Anderson is evidence of what can rise to the top when all values have been abandoned, when nothing really matters anymore except culture wars and culture wars, when really the only thing you can... What does he mean, for example, when he says, I want my country back? That's what Brexit was supposed to deliver. So who are you going to blame if you voted Brexit to get your country back and you agree with 30p Lee that you haven't got your country back? You don't know what you mean, but you need someone to blame. Are you going to blame the party that's been in power since 2016 when you voted to get your country back? So there's so much going on here that I, I am going to ask you this question. Is Lee Anderson proof of any particular pudding or is he just himself the pudding oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three i mean a truly ridiculous individual but truly ridiculous individuals can rise to power in corrupted countries and do terrible things i, I can't see much prospect of 30p lee being in that kind of category but i want to know whether you think 
whether you think he is... Uh, well, I mean, you can probably get better words than I'm coming up with. I'm looking for a word that describes a, a specific moment, an individual, a one-off, an aberration. No, we're getting there slowly. Is he an aberration or is he proof of a broader issue? All right, hit the numbers now, you will get through. And if you are in Ashfield, uh, how do you feel about the fact that he's not going to have a by-election? He's now He was in the Labour Party 10 minutes ago, then he joined the Tory party, then he left it, and now he's... Got, they got slung out of it, and now he's gone after something else. Raymond's in Falkirk in central Scotland, which is definitely not in Ashfield. Raymond, what would you like to say? What is going on here? Good morning, Mr O'Brien. Hello, Raymond. I haven't spoken to you for just over two years. Why not? And have you, are you all right? Have you been, have you been put... Are you all right? Are you well? My wife, that particular last time, the wife had actually slammed the door on me, and she threatened if I ever phoned yourself or LBC, she was going to go through all the divorce, et cetera. Oh, where is she? Is she out? Oh, is she, is she, she, got... she doesn't know. She's up the stairs at the moment. Well, keep so your I'm voice down. Taking this opportun- oh, sorry. Keep I'm sorry. This, no. is, this, is me, this is me. Sorry. Go. This is me trying to be calm. My blood pressure through the roof. I'm apoplectic at what's went on this morning. Go on. I've just sat and watched the biggest circus show I have. This, is, this has become, this is the worst this is Armageddon. Any uh, uh, words, uh, words that I, I can normally speak a thousand words a minute, but um, I got to the extent I'm nearly speechless. I have lo- I've watched two galoots, two galoots, Richard Tice and Lee Anderson. Lee Anderson got banned from the, the Labour Party. Lee Anderson, for goodness sake, what's next? Is it going to be Tommy Robinson? Is this is this is beyond? This is no laughing matter. Well, it this is. is you have to laugh. I mean, your anger notwithstanding, there is definitely a lot of room for laughter here. Even in his speech, he'd barely drawn breath and someone started laughing. And he said, who's laughing? I mean, I, I, I'm somewhere well, between... I feel your anger. I really do. But I don't, I, think, I, I don't think he's worth it, mate. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I've got to stand for something at 79 years of age. Yes, fair 79 enough. years of age. And I, I was diagnosed with hypertension, hypertension years ago. But today, I'm going to have a heart attack if I don't get rid of just some of some of my motion, because I'm looking at, this is not the lunatics taking over, the, they have actually, they've just, I saw his attitude being asked a question from someone from Sky, I believe, called Beth Rigby. Yes, she's and good. And I go back years ago when we had the Brian Waldens, the people... Could no, don't, least, don't start slagging off Beth, I like her. I think she's really good. I, I think she's great. Oh, I thank goodness for that. Class, oh, thank goodness but, for that. The, the answer was three, it was... He was treating everybody with disdain. They're actually laughing at the people. The unfortunate thing is, the people who voted for Brexit, it was the same with Boris Johnson. It's not me. It's them in there. It's them in Parliament. Yes. And you had the goats, the goats that voted like sheep to say that Boris is one of us. And Lee Anderson is one of us. One of us. No, he's no. He's no one of me because, quite honestly, I have never been so. The state of our politics, and it's went on the. We've we've already been through COVID and the war, and we're here and we're there. And every every balloon that comes out as an MP never answers never answers a question. You've got a beautiful vocabulary, right? And relax. Sorry, no, don't stop. No, and relax. And relax. I'm with your wife now. No, hang on. Come on. Come on. In for four. Hold for seven, out for eight. Let's just get it. Let's get our breathing back under control. Let's calm things all right, down. All right, all right. Calm, calm. No. Yes. And final yes. question, simple answer. Is is he yes. not just a one-off? Or is he evidence of a broader awfulness? Could I say something to you? Please, yes. I don't mean to be... I'm not trying to be controversial. Uh-oh. I think, I think, I think the politics in the United Kingdom... And I'm from Scotland, as yeah. you can understand, with that accent. Yes. But I think it's like... A, God Almighty, and this, I don't want to, 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 to offend him. This is like a cancer that's in our politics. And it's, it's, it's rife. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. If you look in the streets, the streets, lawlessness. There is, there is nothing working in this country. And the buffoons have got the affrontery to say, as I say, who's going to be next? Tommy Robinson, because it can't get any worse. I, well, I, don't, any- I don't know that you took my uh, it, it, exhortation to breathe there and to, and to calm down. But the question of whether or not, because, you know, why are you talking about it? A lot of love coming in for you, Raymond, actually, even if your wife's very cross with you. But, um, yeah, as Ian points out, you didn't really keep your voice down either. So I think she'll be aware that you've been on the phone to, to, to that LBC again. Um, but a lot of people saying you speak for them uh, and yet not answering my question of, of whether or not, because why are you talking about him? I, I answer hand on heart, because I think he's hilarious. 
unintentionally hilarious. 30p Lee, from the minute he popped his funny little head above the political parapet, has been making us giggle, sniggle and smile like few other politicians have ever managed to do. Entirely unintentionally. Um, and not least because he, 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 he's such a joker, you know, setting up interviews on doorsteps, having told his mate to pretend he's not his mate, and then his mate letting him down anyway by going off on some mad rant about the cat of nine tails and making people wear tutus. And he's gone on the record in the last month, probably. Certainly this year, 2024, talking about the party he's just joined being being terrible and not the answer to anything. So that's why I am talking about him personally on this programme because I think he's hilarious and we can have some fun. But the phone-in looks at the slightly more important question of whether or not he is an individual aberration, just literally a one-off, or whether he is evidence of a broader malaise, as I think Raymond was was attesting. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.37 is the time. Say what you like about Brexit, but David Cameron's decision to call a referendum in order to remove the threat of an even further right party picking off MPs from within there, that's gone brilliantly, hasn't it? No wonder they've brought him back and promoted him to the House of Lords and made him Foreign Secretary. Has there ever been a more sagacious political decision by a party leader, nay, a Prime Minister, in modern times than David Cameron's decision to have a referendum on membership of the European Union in order to fend off the, the risk of defections from the Tory party to whatever outfit Farage has lent his name to this week. Um, although, of course, in the case of 30p Lee, it's not a technical defection because he wasn't in the Tory party at the time. More, perhaps, an infection. Our political editor, Natasha Clark, had the... I'm quite... It's not often I'm jealous of you having to go to these things, but that one was proper funny, wasn't it? It was great fun. Um, yeah, what a mad, mad thing we've all just witnessed. I'm really sad you, you did miss that. I think the sketch writers are going to have an absolute field day tomorrow with that one. Um, yes, in a building just off Whitehall, obviously a very uh, sort of old school room. Uh, we're all, all eyes peeled on this wooden door that we're expecting Lee Anderson to walk through. And he does uh, a smattering of, of, of muted applause from the back of the room. And we all just turn to look at him. Photographers absolutely everywhere trying to scrum uh, in. And yes, he started off by asking us all why on earth we were giggling at him. I want my country back. Over the last year or so, I've had to do a lot of soul searching on my political journey. And it was laughing. And I don't expect much in politics other than to be able to speak my mind and speak on behalf... Is that you, Harry, laughing? Speak on behalf of my friends, family and my constituents. Now... I might not know a lot of these long words some of the people use in Parliament, but I know a few short ones. Uh, but unfortunately, this sometimes leads me to be labelled as controversial. Controversial in my opinions. But my opinions are not controversial. There are opinions which are shared by millions of people up and down the country. I'd quick word for David, who had quite an unpleasant experience listening to that initially, because he started laughing when he said, I want my country back. And he's laughing out loud. And then Lee Anderson said, who's laughing? And David, I don't know if you've ever had this. I sometimes have it when I wake up in the morning and the radio is my alarm. And it sort of invades my dreams, Natasha. Yes, and I, I, get I have to work, that too. And sometimes I forget, <laughs> did I hear that on the radio or did I dream it? He dream? thought that the television was talking to him. <laughs> David thought when, when, when 30p Lee said, who's laughing? David was actually laughing. <laughs> And thought that perhaps somehow the television had invaded his consciousness. But no, but no. We, we were go. all laughing. We the reason laughing. was because yes. um, Mr. Anderson stood on top of the stage and put his laptop down to read a few opening remarks. And he stood in front that of the flag. That was scripted, what he just said then. Yes, it was. No. Yeah. Shut up. It was. Good he, Lord. And he stood, no, in front of a flag. He stood in front of a flag. Right. Oh, sorry, sorry, behind a flag. So, so the, the flag, flag was in was front, in front of, him. of him. Right. So the pool cl camera, and you'll see this if you would like to rewind any of the mm. coverage from today, of a picture of Mr. Anderson standing behind a flag. And that's why we were laughing, because he was standing so far behind it, you couldn't see his face anymore. So, yes, that prompted quite a lot of giggles. So what happened to the flag? The did, it, did, it, did it sort of move? Was it a bit like the Theresa May speech? Someone where... eventually realised that he was 
standing in front. Uh, was it like that it, it BBC clip where the kids came in the back? Did someone crawl onto the stage? And yes, move someone literally the... came up and took the flag away, and then we laughed again. So yes, it was uh, it was and amusing he didn't know to why say you the were least. Laughing. No, exactly. But and he <laughs> thought we were laughing at him because well, obviously some people around the country were laughing at the idea uh, of his speech, but uh, we just were laughing at the fact that he was standing on a flag. <laughs> Wait, were you, just to be clear, were you laughing or sniggling? Uh, both. Somewhere between. Bit of bit of both, and okay. it was yeah around the room. But yes, um, and as I think the press conference got um, went on he got more and more tetchy because everybody started to remind him of some of the nasty things that he'd been saying about reform uh, including just a few uh, weeks ago where he called Richard Tice a pound shop farage. Look I absolutely and I think millions of British people endorse the concerns and sentiments of what Lee was saying which is that we are sick and tired of our streets being taken over by these pro Hamas <laughs> extremist anti-semitic uh, people and Islamist extremists. That's the concerns that people want to hear about. And um, you know, in terms of pence, pounds, I tell you what, maybe you know, if you look after the pence, the pounds look after themselves. They had an answer what? for that one. What? <laughs> because you, because if, he was called a pound shop, Nigel Farage. Right. That was his joke. Yeah. It ties him nicely with 30p Lee as well, doesn't it? Yeah. There's many layers to that joke. Okay. But and are there, are there a lot of protests against the uh, situation in Gaza in Ashfield is it a big is it a big hot spot not, for not pro Palestinian I, not marches? that I know of but I could be wrong right um, but yes my favourite part of the press conference uh, I think was where he went on to admit that he did quit the Tories and join reform because his mum told him to oh. somebody um, and he has to make a stand and I said it last week there's 650 MPs in that building over there and if not one can speak out for the good of this country then quite frankly what's the point in being there I have to live with my conscience. My conscience is clear. When I go and see my parents yesterday on Mother's Day, happy Mother's Day, Mother, and they say to me, Lee, you need to join reform, but this country needs saving. Uh, we're absolutely fed up with what's happening on the streets of London. We're fed up with what's happening up and down the country. We're just fed up. We need change. If my parents are saying that, then I, I can sleep, sleep well. Right, uh, quite frankly, he's, yeah, uh, his, his mum told him happy to. Happy Mother's Day, Mother. Happy Mother's I, I should, Day. May I just also take this opportunity to say Happy Mother's Day to my mother. Um, uh, did she? Does she want you to join I, a political I, party? I, I think she's had enough of what's going on on the streets of London. <laughs> that's, that's they talk of little else in Kidderminster uh, and apparently Ashfield, <laughs> Ashfield as too. well. Yeah, is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay. those are the highlights. Okay, put your proper hat on now. Um, your grown up hat. What? Um, is it significant in any way, really? It is significant. It's Why? Really, no, I know you have to say that because you're the reforms. political editor of LBC, but is it? Actually? I know, no, I know, I know that. I know it's significant. They've now got an MP. I can count. Mm. But does it change anything? Do we no. wake up next? No. Right. Is that that's the answer you were looking for, right? Not necessarily. <laughs> I was looking for the honest answer, but not the stuff I already knew. Do yeah. you think this change? Because Christopher Hope is reporting. He's someone else that defected to the reform. Oh, no, he joined GB, same thing. He joined GB, he's having once been a proper journalist on the Daily Telegraph, and he's saying that, that Tice claims there are nine MPs in, in negotiations to mm, join. Yeah, that was what I was told by a reform source as well, yeah. um, saying that there could be another, yeah, up to eight or nine Tory MPs that could do the same and could now defect. Now, I think, you know, you'll remember back to the Brexit days. They, uh, they said that again and again. They led this up the garden path. Um, obviously, this is a high-profile defection for them, but I just do, don't think there are going to be eight Tory MPs lining up to join reform, um, especially when they're not doing any better than the Conservatives are. I'm not saying that they're not doing well. They obviously are doing 15% of the polls. It's not far behind the Conservative Party, right? But the chances of them actually winning a seat and the chance of Lee Anderson holding on to his seat are still quite slim. And Lee Anderson's majority at the last election, around 6,000. Like, obviously, probably that's going to go back to the Labour Party as many of these red wall seats will go. Is there any chance that by the time of the election, 30 Peely may have rejoined the Labour Party? Well, you know, he's, he's, he's joined two or three other political parties. So 3P, 3Party, <laughs> 30P or 3Party Lee, take your pick. He's gone on a real journey, hasn't he, the past few years? First from Labour, then to the Tories, now to Reform. And he said earlier, you addressed some of that criticism, saying, I haven't changed, the parties have changed. Well, all I've, of them. Exactly. It's like, how many political parties do you think it is acceptable to join? And yes, he will have to be sitting on another opposition bench now. He can't be sitting in with his mates in the, in the Tory party well, Are they still his uh, mates? Anymore. Yeah, he's went and sat in at Prime Minister's questions, just going and join them like nothing but happened. But he's left them now. But yes, well, they you know he's refused to apologise again for those comments that he made about Sadiq Khan today. And, and that Richard Tice doesn't want that is objectively yeah, disgusting. It is, but. and Richard Tice doesn't want to distance himself from those comments either. They both just ignored the question on that. That's the number of the issue really here is that he decides that he's not going to say sorry. And yes, the Reform Party are jumping on that bandwagon of trying to be this party of of common sense and and, and free 
thinking and free speech um, and, you know, saying that this morning that nothing works and Britain is broken. But he's been a part of that Conservative government and part of that Conservative Party that's overseen that for the last 14 years. So, yes, it's it's not a, a fantastic message. I don't think it's a very contradictory message for so many people to be waking up going, hang on, you were literally a Tory chair, vice chairman just 12 months ago. And now look at you. And seven years ago, you were a Labour councillor. Exactly. And I just I don't think people will Gloria, be able to trust Gloria Del Piero's campaign manager on her yes he was working with her yeah successful bid to be an mp in 2015 have i got with that or answer anyway whatever so who can keep up who cares the one thing i would like to know is what will rishi sunak be thinking i think he'll just dismiss it i think he'll just say look but i think you know he should be concerned that reform are taking a good chunk of the of the conservative party vote he should obviously be concerned about that but I think he can just shrug this off, especially as someone that he, you know, has very much distanced himself from the past few weeks and has taken the Tory whip off him. I think he should just say, good riddance, you're gone, mate. Sorry. That, yes, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I just, finally, one more word on this parallel with, with 2015, um, uh, 2014, 2015, 2016, when mm. the, 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 there was a golden prize of a referendum. Yeah. Uh, I mean, sadly, uh, people believe that it was both desirable and something that should be voted for to leave the European Union. Many of them, of course, rue the day, but not 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 all of them by any stretch of the imagination. And Cameron's majority, well, he was he was governing in coalition, so his electoral position was was weak. His his political position was weak in Parliament, so the fear of defections was real. None of those, neither of those factors apply to the modern Conservative Mm. Party. The majority is big enough to get almost anything they want through Parliament. And there is no holy grail for, uh, you know, attention-seeking so-called Eurosceptics like Nigel Farage. So what, what, I mean, apart from talking about pro-Palestinian protests. What, yeah, what, what's what the is, end goal? Yes, well, how does one get one's country back? Yeah, I, I, it, that's the thing. There's no golden bullet here. There's no. no, oh, we want a referendum on leaving the European Union. We want Brexit, which is what we saw from Douglas Carlswell, what we saw from Mark Reckless, which is why they joined, jumped ship and joined over to UKIP, calling for that referendum to yes. happen. And from from um, Lee's speech this morning, there isn't one. There is not one hope. There is not one sort of aim that he's going for. It's just this message of Britain is broken. It's going for that anti-establishment establishment vote and try and i think for lee it's probably just a hope that he can hold on to his seat in ashfield isn't it i don't think there's anything more so to he's it just that. done that because he thinks it makes it marginally less likely that he'll get spanked as a reform candidate in ashfield than i can't he would see as a Tory candidate. i can't see why else and obviously he's been boxed in because the conservative party are not going to let him back in because he's not going to apologize for his remarks so he may as well be thinking well if i'm going to stand as an independent candidate and interestingly he's not called a by-election as well that's that's but, but he two voted in 2020 did. for for legislation that would insist that MPs who defect exactly. did, did vote for by-elections. It's uh, almost as if he doesn't stand for anything. I don't think it was... He, yes, he think he signed an early day motion petition mm. on that, but I don't think he voted... There was not voted for legislation but on that. But he's expressed his support. Yeah, he has, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, so, him. yes, it's a conf- very confusing message coming from Lee Anderson this morning, and I personally don't quite understand what he's trying to do. Do you know where Douglas Carswell is now? I don't. Working for an opaquely funded think tank in Mississippi. Well, good luck, Lee. <laughs> It's 11.49. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 11.53. Here's a little riddle for you before I introduce my next guest. If Nigel Farage is a pound shop Enoch Powell and Richard Tice is a pound shop Nigel Farage, what does that make Lee Anderson? Answers on a postcard, please. Um, Ollie has raised that question. Where where would that go next? In some ways, he adds, uh, surely Nigel Farage is the pound shop Nigel Farage. This is all too confusing for me. Thankfully, (laughs) thankfully, Andreas Georgiou is here to uh, steer us through uh, an article published at the weekend about the difficulties that retailers in the UK are having, getting their hands on goods that were once very easy to get their hands on. It's a nice headline and a nice picture of you, Andreas. Not a sausage. How the Mm -hmm. latest post-Brexit checks have hit UK delis. Now, you were one of the people that was ringing into this programme seven years ago to tell us about problems that were on the horizon. Mm -hmm. Are they now here? Well, they're here now. And I mean, what we're seeing now is the business end of the deal that was signed by Boris Johnson and David Frost. And... A lot of it's been made up as we go along. So in 2020, for example, at the beginning of it, you know, we were doing one-page declarations to get stuff in. Um, up to September last year, it was like 13 pages without the transport, 
This is per load, per the... 13 pages of paperwork for, for what, a pallet or a that's lorry? A pa- that's a, just for a pallet of pasta. For one pallet of low, pasta. Which is very low risk. Coming in from Italy. Yeah. And, presu- and previously, you'd have done no paperwork at no all. No paperwork would have been here in a week. That took seven weeks to get here. Um, and what we're seeing now, for example, is under this sort of new rules, which came in on the 31st of January, is what was supposed to be a much easier way of doing things. So they've dressed it up as a, a fuss three, yeah. fuss three thing, where in fact it's actually because there's no paperwork involved, it's all online, but you're still doing the paperwork and uploading it. You're so just doing it on a screen rather than do it on paper. Doing it on a screen or so whatever. It, yes. But what that now... Red tape, we could call it. If, like, technically no, not but there isn't any red tape, James. No, of course there's silly. no red tape. Sorry, don't sorry, sorry. Don't no so red tape. Silly. No. What is it? So Purple what it means ribbons. now for the independent sector is that we're distro- disproportionately affected. So, for example, um, if a supermarket was to fill up a lorry full of chickens... Uh, or oven ready chickens, if you want to call them, they would only have one phytosanitary certificate yeah. and one vet visit for the so whole lorry. For the whole lorry, they're all 20, going to the same shop. Yeah, so yeah. twenty five quid. Whereas with us, so for example, one of my suppliers, Smith and Brock, and the long suffering Robin Arno and Ben. Um, now, if they have forty different customers who want forty different animals, for example, they have to have forty different vet visits. And 40 different phyto certificates. And 40 bills. And 40 bills. So this is expensive. And there was no infrastructure put in place. When this deal was signed and done, I don't suppose the British government spoke to the French government well, about... Well, you've, you've preempted my question in a way, which is whether or not they would have... And, and I know we're not talking about the brains of Britain when we remember who was responsible for negotiating this. Mm-hmm. David Frost, chiefly, mm-hmm. and, and, and at Boris Johnson's behest, with Dominic Cummings hanging mm-hmm. around in the background. Would they have had the first idea what they were actually... No, I mean, in? remember when we spoke in 2018, mm-hmm. the Brexit Secretary had no idea the majority of our food came through the tunnel. He was taken by surprise. He by was that. taken by yes, Dominic Rob, So, what that kind of and um, what they didn't take into account that France has a tr- chronic shortage of vets, right? And also, nothing was put in place with the French government. Obviously, the French government are probably slightly peeved with the British government, particularly with Boris Johnson's comments about Macron. But they're being really rigid. So, if something gets to the port, it has to wait for at least twenty-four to forty-eight hours to be checked before it leaves. So um, no goodwill, no well, well no, no appetite from government because you can't fix a problem well, until you admit that you've got no one. No one's going to do business with this current government now. No. I mean, we have to hope that something changes. And with that, but nothing was put in place. So, for example, Arno in France had to go and find how to do this. Got it. There was nothing in place. And then, you know, I had a circumstance in in November, where I was trying to import my panettones, of which you got one at Christmas, I believe. I did indeed, for uh, disclosure. Very delicious it was too. Fantastic. Now, that took 14 days for me to get them in. And uh, thank God for Jackie and Tessa, European specialty salads, because they really went overboard. But we shouldn't have to be doing this. And is there any light at the end of the tunnel? There's absolutely none. Oh. I mean, and we can only hope that a change of government will see a, a softening of relationships but as it stands at the moment you know we're, we're literally stuck um and a lot of stuff isn't making it to the shelves there's a lot of delays so you so uh, some of the other uh, people in the same line of work as you who are quoted in this article at the weekend talk about reducing the supplies that they've got on their shelves stopping product I mean, lines and, and that's Re- david joseph of panzers panzers is an institution it's, it's not just Wood. a shop yeah absolutely you know and it and i mean i've had a lot of conversations with david and with camille his partner and because the suppliers are saying we're just not doing this anymore you know, it's just not, it doesn't matter goodwill, how much we love you it doesn't matter how far it, back our relationship goes, goes but I the, can't the, do this the goodwill is, is, is waning I mean yeah. it's also the other way I spoke to Eurologistics a company that handles freight going in and out I mean last week they, they say generally they used to get 40 Arctics leaving Britain with produce last week they had 6 and another thing that stopped now is you know there used to be like 30 or 40 little vans go over to France on mm. a Thursday and Friday to load up for those little lovely French markets and whatever that's finished on Friday there were none because you can't do mixed vans and mixed lorries of produce because you need to have I mean it is far it is awful but and it's expensive so you know if I've got 40 lines on the lorry and I need 40 phyto certificates that's two grand on top of a grand well what used to be a grand for a probably two yeah. grand and then we've got worse to follow we've got the physical checks that are due in April the security checks that are due in October I mean the physical checks I mean 
I'm I'm one of very few people in the UK. Maybe there's a hundred of us who know fine food, etc. Yeah. Maybe a hundred, maybe two hundred. Um, you can't expect a customs officer to, to know understand. what something is. Well, know what something is. Got it. And so, if that one pallet on a twenty-four pallet lorry is rejected, the lorry has to go back. The whole there's lorry no way. Goes back. You know, and the it's Financial Times reporting this morning that the twenty-two million pound border facility at the port of Harwich hmm. is not ready. It's not um, ready. It's it? supposed to start at the end of next month. This is all the trucks delivering food and animal products from the EU. It's where they'll be inspected. So even mm. if they, you know, adding checks when they were previously were none, but they're not even ready I mean, to do I mean, that the, th- the thing is, this didn't need to happen. I mean, I'm not talking about the vote or whatever. It just could have been, you could have had actual experts advising. But this is so disproportionately in favour of the super. Well, this is the point I wanted to end with, is that the people most squeezed are the, the, the single shop outlets the people who've got two yeah. or three shops the, well, the small even, businesses even if the people that are the shops, even if you're a budgeons or even if you're a right if you're whatever. not if you're not sainsbury's you're going to get yeah, hit yeah, much you're harder get, you're going to get whacked so you're already fighting them on some fronts mm. um and now the government has given them new weapons with which to hit yeah you even i mean harder. i mean i think today has been a day of conspiracy so i don't think <laughs> it's been quite have you thought about photoshopping any of your uh any oh, of your God. commentaries andreas it's always a pleasure if you've not if you are ever in chelsea anywhere near chelsea green it's an absolute beautiful shop which is andreas just mentioned i have occasionally uh, availed myself of its produce on occasion and you've got a little restaurant opening soon as we well we have at the end of the month kell street opens is that partly because you have to sort of look we've at, expanded uh, yeah. massively uh with a, in the traditional andreas way with no money sure um we've expanded simply because I, my children have to have something you know i have to have something for them so by expanding our business and going into new areas we can get the money that we hope to D- diversify give them a, a little bit because the the traditional business is, is is being punched a bit but not that it affects the quality of the service you provide but i suspect that by tea time today can be bad not may offer up your new restaurant in chelsea green as a brexit benefit then uh it's certainly not a brexit benefit well, that's, that's <laughs> never stopped her in the past that's what i'd be doing well, get the business secretary on the line tell her i found a brexit benefit there's uh, a little 14 seater restaurant opening in chelsea green as a direct consequence of the fact that the green grocer next door is having such a nightmare getting stuff into the country yeah but i mean it makes sense because obviously we have the produce exactly. and we had the site already and there's no way i was going to let number four go it's beautiful been... thank you mate always thank a pleasure you, james two minutes after 12 you are listening to james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc Six minutes after 12 is the time. Uh, do you know what we're going to talk about? Well, of course you don't. I haven't told you yet. But it's a, it's a bit of a difference, this. It's a bit of a departure. We're going to talk about nightlife. And obviously, uh, as, as someone of my vintage, someone of my age, it's, it's I, I, first glance, I thought, well, this isn't that relevant to me. I, 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 the, the, August, I think, of last year, it was reported that the UK had lost a third of its clubs in just three years. I think lockdown did for a lot of them, but you would have expected, in fact, we spoke to people who were shutting their doors very reluctantly, permanently, because, you know, the landlords weren't being very helpful or they hadn't managed to benefit from the furlough schemes or because their staff was casual or all sorts of reasons why. But I thought they'd come back again. I I just thought they'd come back again. One of the strangest things about growing up or getting older is the realisation that, that nothing is permanent, isn't it? Nothing. I mean, on a really, really serious level, I always think of Roe versus Wade. I was studying it for A-level, uh, American politics, comparative politics. Roe versus Wade was so huge. And you think that that was permanent. And then, of course, along comes Donald Trump and his, his sort of diabolical agenda. And even Roe versus Wade. So nothing's permanent. Tony Benn talked about this. Nothing's permanent. You, you, just, you just have to keep pushing back against the forces of evil because if you don't, they will take over and there are periods in history where they do take over and then you have to push back ever harder and ever more dangerously to ensure that they get pushed back again. So nothing's permanent. And I know that sounds a bit highfalutin for a conversation about nightclubs, but I just presumed that nightclubs were a, a constant, a sort of a, 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 a non-negotiable. There are young people... And young people like to party, therefore they need places to party, therefore nightclubs will always be necessary. But they haven't started reopening. A third of the clubs in the country, the UK, lost a third of its clubs in just three years, um, and they are not coming back. Uh, Obviously the pandemic played a part in that, as I mentioned, but there must be other reasons as well. And you might not think it's very interesting to ring a radio station today and tell me why you 
don't go clubbing. But I'm interested. I'm really interested. I think that I think I can get quite emotional about clubbing, which might be weird. Because it's one of those things you'll either get completely or won't get at all. Night clubbing changed my life. It changed my life in ways that I, I still probably don't fully appreciate. You know, I, my school was very repressed and re repressive. It was a very old-fashioned school. It was all boys for a start, and it was boarding for seconds. And just to go for a terrible hat trick, it was run by monks. When I started at my boarding school, the Monty Python film Life of Brian was still banned. Uh, they were not what you would call conducive to frank and open conversations. And if it wasn't for nightclubs, I, I, I think nightclubs rescued me in some ways from being a, a, a product of that system, from being a sort of unquestioning product of that system. I was incredibly lucky to be in Manchester in 1988 doing a, a youth theatre where I had more freedom than I'd ever had in my life. And I used it to go with my new friends from the theatre company to nightclubs. I'd love to say I was at the Hacienda every night. I wasn't quite at the Hacienda every night, but I did go in that amazing... Hey, for, for, you know, the first time I went to the Hacienda, I was wearing brogues. I was wearing brogues and a waistcoat. That's what a little cliche, a little Lord Fauntleroy, like a sort of pound shop Jacob Rees Mogg to continue today's political themes. And um, by the time uh, I went back, I was wearing um, bright red feeler high tops. But it just brought me into a world I didn't know existed. I don't, I'm not going to apologize for getting emotional about this or getting a bit dewy eyed. Because the question of what do we lose when we lose nightclubs? And we're also going to ask what do we lose when we lose venues, music venues, smaller music venues, is one that I want you to answer today. What do we lose when we lose nightclubs? O three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. What do we lose when we lose smaller music venues? O three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Because they are shutting down at a rate of knots. I think there's a bit of snobbery involved as well. John Harris writes a great piece in The Guardian today where he reminds us that the budget last week included help for theatres and orchestras. Now, I will cheer that to the rafters. Help for theatres and orchestras. Desperately important. Desperately important. But... No help for night spots or whatever you prefer to call them. Um, no, no, no money for dance floors. And if you think about what we've done well in the last 30 years, I mean, seriously, I know it's an overused phrase, but what is genuinely world beating? You're going to talk broadly about culture, but very specifically about music. And whether you like it or not, we still produce, partly because of the universality of the English language, let's be honest, but, but we still produce routinely the biggest artists in the world. Whether you're talking about Ed Sheeran or Coldplay or, or, or the Arctic Monkeys, it, it, is, it is simply a matter of record that this country, this ti these tiny islands punch way above their weight when it comes to music but where do the new arctic monkeys cut their teeth where, where does ed sheeran the new the next ed sheeran where do they cut their teeth if all the clubs and venues are closing down now you can do some of it on instagram or tiktok but that's a different medium that's a very different uh, uh context isn't it no, no one has ever felt their world I don't think anyone has ever felt the ground shift beneath their feet as a consequence of watching something on TikTok. Live music. Ah, when we lose live music, we lose something really, really precious. But I can't necessarily... Um, do you know what, Martin, in Manchester? I did on occasion go to Fridays in Didsbury, although I never went to Xanadu in Romford, but I did go to Fridays in Didsbury. I also went to the venue on Whitworth Street, which was the place where people who'd been turned away by the Hacienda, probably for wearing brogues and a waistcoat, would congregate instead. Uh, it, was, it was a slightly more indie than dance music vibe. But I, 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 I think by the time I moved to London, after a year in Manchester, I spoke a very different language from the language I would have spoken if I'd not discovered that whole scene. I used to go to Shelley's in Stoke-on-Trent as well for anybody of a certain age. It's, it, it changed my life. It changed my life in probably political ways as well as personal ways. Just opened up friendships that I've still got, parts of the world that I didn't have, uh, I would never have had access to. They are a hugely democratic phenomenon, nightclubs. So what do we lose? And I'm not a musician, remember. I don't, um, 
I don't play an instrument and I don't and I can't sing, but I do like attending live music gigs. I, I do. I'm going to one in Bristol on Friday at a smallish venue, not a massive venue. Uh, and and because my daughters absolutely love live music. In fact, the last live music gig I went to, one of them was playing in. So we do our best, but you know the days of you being able to go to a gig almost every night of the week, which was the case when I first moved to London, they are long behind us. There, there, there are three questions here, I think. What well, one is about what we lose, and that gets asked twice. It gets asked once in the context of nightclubs and once in the context of small music venues because we lose different things as a consequence of losing those two, all right? Oh, three, four, five, six. Oh, God, William. When we lose live music, James, we lose happiness. Oh, three, four, five, six, oh, six, oh, nine, seven, three. And then there is a question about, is it just money? Because there's chicken and egg here, isn't there? Why are young people not going out in the way that they used to when we were young, in the way that we used to when we were young? Is the answer that they can't afford it, or is the answer that the venues have closed, or have the venues closed because they can't afford it? In which case, is there a case for some form of subsidy or some sort of public service approach to nightlife in the way that no one balks at opera or theatre getting subsidised, possibly music venues and, and even nightclubs should as well. So what do we lose? What do we lose as a society? Why are young people not going? And how would you have grown up differently? I, I'm not doing a very good job of explaining how it changed my life. I'm just dropping cultural references into the conversation and then sort of fondly remembering amazing moments. I'll tell you one moment in my life that was magical. And I can't remember the name of the club. It was, oh, again, it was in Manchester. And it was, so you're looking at, I think this would be 1990 probably. And when things had really kicked off, when the whole dance music scene had really kicked off. And it was one of those clubs that still felt that it was in the early 80s. You know, there were mirror balls everywhere and, and very, very 1980s decor. It wasn't a dance club yet. It was an old-fashioned nightclub, kind of place where you wouldn't have been allowed in wearing jeans a few years previously. But the promoters had started picking it up for dance nights. And I was dancing on a podium, not, not alone on a podium. I was like on a little stage with loads of other people. And a bloke in a Manchester City shirt, a big lad in a Manchester City shirt sort of pointed at me from the middle of the dance floor. And a little bit of me panicked because I thought, oh, no, he's probably noticed that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't fit in or you've got the chip on your shoulder or whatever it is. And he, and he sort of comes through, only pop, pop, six people maybe, climbs up on the podium next to us and just gives me this massive sweaty bear hug. I still don't know why, but those little moments that you have as a consequence of clubbing open up doors to you that don't get opened anywhere else and don't get opened by anyone else so how did it change your life what are we going to lose and why aren't young people doing it oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three don't tend to talk about my girls much um except very obliquely but i can tell you that one of them went to paris recently and went clubbing for the first time and i couldn't believe it when she explained it to me because I thought, well, why haven't you done that here? What do you, you know, you go out all the time, but they go to each other's houses. They don't go, they don't go clubbing in the way that they did when I was eighteen and nineteen. But in Paris, they did. So let's just have a chat about it, shall we? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Twenty minutes after twelve is the time. It's sort of happening, isn't it, in plain sight, and yet not getting the attention that many of us think it probably deserves. So, so fair play to John Harris in The Guardian today. But the decline of nightlife, what, what's it going to do? Why is it happening and what's it going to do? Sam's in Lambeth. Sam, you can kick us off. What would you like to say? Hi, Nick. Um, basically, it's all to do, in my opinion, with the Nick. licensing. Do you really think that Nick Ferrari was at the Hacienda in 1988? Uh, to be fair, I was um, half, um, not only half awake, but you do sound quite similar sometimes. Well, I've got it's, a very froggy throat. He's, out, he's on holiday. <laughs> not only is he not, in the, not on the radio at the moment, he's not even in the country. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, if he'd been on a podium in Discotheque Royale in Manchester in 1990, was, that would have been that would have been a I sight for thinking, the ages. That was really out of character for That's him. A, an extraordinary <laughs> intervention. A very, a, this one's taken an unexpected turn. Sam, carry on, but don't call me Nick. Sorry. Again. Just call, <laughs> call me Albert. Carry on. Um, um, 
so no it in my opinion is all to do with the licensing of these venues oh. so a lot of places during the week aren't allowed to open past 12 anymore there's no such thing as a lock-in anymore that's completely gone um all of the like smoking bans have really killed a lot of places in london nah, as well not anymore mate How, no, well, no smoking you, bans did that damage what, what years I mean, ago what I, what I mean by that is if you go to a nightclub let's say in germany Right, you've got places in there you can smoke. You've got places in there where are hip and trendy and cool. But nowadays, the only places like that are in central London, and they only open Friday, maybe on a Thursday. Oh, okay. But like that whole midweek thing is completely gone. So then the question is not so much, oh, we want to go out, but it's like, where do we go? And now it's kind of only on like unis ca- uni campuses, and even that they're cracking down on. There was a lot of like the illegal raving, which wasn't really hurting anyone. How old are you? If the, uh, 21, but I've been calling in since I was about 15. <laughs> One day you get my name right. But you, you, <laughs> uh, you I, I didn't even know illegal raving was still a thing. Oh, of course it is. There have been occasions. It's a massive. Happened a bit during yeah. lockdown as well. So, I, the, how, uh, when did the. I'm surprised you know so much at 21 because I'd have thought you'd be a victim of the not having gone out much generation. No, no, no. So we used to go out to what, so like these park motives nowadays are yeah. massive because, so like 15, you go out, you know, like you back in the day, you grab a whatever alcohol you can find, go out, play some music in a park and then from there, you get a fake ID, you go out, but it's more, there's nowhere to go out. Yeah. Like past 12 o'clock, it's done and the only places that are open our uh, um, LGBT clubs get special licenses where they can open yeah. midweek past certain times. And obviously a lot of like newer like teens and stuff don't particularly want to be there. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's a real... No, it's no, a real well, we, we don't know then, chicken, chicken, egg. And the, why has the licensing thing happened? Is it, is it because areas are more residential well, or...? No, no, not at all. It's over, I don't want to say over policing, but it's just a lack of, like, lack of direction. They think it's going to stop crime because no one's going to be out late. No one's going to be falling out late. Yeah. So where do you, where do, I mean, at one o'clock on a Saturday night, where would your average 21-year-old be these days? Well, most probably the main strips, if you're from South London, are in uh, Clapham or in, you know, there's places in Kingston, but it's not even, like, main places where there's loads of different clubs you can go to. It's, like, in certain areas there's only one place and the, but you're telling places. me about the 21 year old clubbers i'm thinking about the 21 year olds who don't go clubbing whereas everyone would have done when i was that age what, what, what do you yeah. do instead what, what what is done instead well, i'm imagining a lot of mm. these people they um they just go home past a certain time or they just drink at home or they they partake in different things but if you look at like a lot of younger people are really depressed i mean they've got they don't go out they don't do much you know they i I think you're right to mention that actually i I, I mean i'm always slightly wary of being part of the back suffering from in my day itis and thinking that everything's better in my day because lots of things were measurably worse but i do i do think that that well i'll tell you how i know that sam's right steph's sent me a lovely text a uh, massive hug for you, James. I think we're the same age. You've just triggered so many memories of clubbing and gigging back in the day. I've now got the biggest smile on my face. All of today's troubles and worries have momentarily disappeared. I really want to listen to the rest of the show, but I also want to blast out some old school dance classics. And and that, that it, you know, it would really take you out of yourself. It would really, really... Uh, remove you from the from the humdrum from the quotidian and I, if you're not getting that I think Sam's perfectly entitled to suggest it might be a contributor to some of the some of the issues that are on the increase among among younger people today thank you mate Alan's in Saffron Walden Alan what would you like to say morning James hello um, uh, you was inviting us to recall back to our great experiences at clubs and I was just yeah it's got to be life changing though I, I, it's got to be life changing it can't just be I had a banging night back in 1992 <laughs> 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 well for me it was go on because um, I was about 20 at the time I was a mod with all my mates and we went to Billy Walker's Uppercut Club in North London where um the Stax label yeah. had all their artists on stage. They were all black guys and girls. Otis Redding, um, wow. Sam and Dave. And um, growing up in a sort of working class family, I, I got kind of inducted into racism. My dad wasn't a rabid racist, but it was it was on the air at the time. And sure. so I had a dislike and a distrust of, uh, of black people. Gosh. And um, it was a really great night at the club. They were all black artists off the label, and I was dancing and jigging away, <laughs> and suddenly the thought occurred to me, 
you're not supposed to like these people. And oh, yet, wow. they're giving you a hell of a night. And from that moment on, my brain, my logical brain kicked in and I stopped being a racist. Basically, oh. I just saw black people as equal to, to white people. I'm and not sure I, you could I, have had that experience in many other contexts, could you? No, no, not really. Not really. It was uh, it was such a good night. I mean, we all listened to because we liked most town. We we all liked you know we're all black artists that, mm. that put out the records. Um, but actually being there in the presence of a multi-racial crowd with all black artists on the stage, you have to examine where what you know where you come from. Basically, I don't must and be the biggest, profound, the, the greatest leveler culture of any kind. But when you're smack in the middle of a dancing crowd, it's probably the biggest leveler of all. Absolutely, absolutely, because you know the good, the good feelings are high. There's you're not you know, fearing for your life or anything like that. We're all just having fun on the spot. And um, as I say, it just brought about a profound... And I've never been a racist ever since. I suppose I love you. I I recall, I think I probably crossed swords with my dad after that. But, uh, you know, not to any bitter extent. Just the uh, the occasional question. Absolutely. I love Absolutely. it. Was that the boxer Billy Walker? Did he did he have a club? Was yeah. it it was crikey. Yeah. I pr- I thought it yeah. might be if he's called you're probably going to be a boxer if you call your club the uppercut, aren't you? But I didn't I didn't know he'd yeah. had a club after his boxing career. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was Billy Walker's uppercut club we went to. As I say, I didn't drive in those days. My mates did all the driving, <laughs> so I can't tell you exactly where it was in North London, but I know it was in North London. Didn't you even have a but, scooter? Uh, Surely you had it. I thought you all had scooters. I did. <laughs> I had a yeah. <laughs> We we we. Well, I was about twenty. I had a scooter when I was seventeen. I had a Lambert TV okay. and uh, went out with the usual crowd, you know, to the to the coast at the weekends. Not looking for fights, just being part of the action. That was all. Happy and, days. Um, yeah. Yeah, we, it is we, believed, we evolved into cars. It, it is believed that Jimi Hendrix wrote "Purple Haze" in the Uppercut Club. Oh really? It is believed wow. that he did. I, I, I've just seen that. I've just, I've just trying to. I was double checking whether or not it was Billy Walker the boxer or not, and that popped up. I was, I'm, so you, I mean, you don't realise it at the time. That's the thing about popular culture. It's just the place you go to. But about, not unlike me, a few years later at the Hacienda in Manchester, you were at the epicentre of a cultural revolution, and and uh, you go, oh, that's a brilliant story. Absolutely brilliant story, and and uh, above and beyond what I was hoping for when I asked that question about how nightlife changes your whole life. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Alan, stay safe, mate. Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. I honestly thought this would be a daft phone-in, but this caller has just completely blown that thought out of the water. You've got to have a little faith, honestly. I've done this for a while now. I know I know roughly, roughly where the magic lies. And questions about the um, magic of nightlife. And we haven't even moved on to music venues. How hard is it to get up and running now as a band? There's another story around today that we nearly did this hour. Keir Starmer due to speak at a school later today about Labour's determination to broaden the cultural offering to state school children uh you you know if, if you have parents if you are parents of children of a relevant age you'll know that 14 years of tory rule has seen some f- fairly serious squeezing of what we would call extracurricular activity whether it's drama or whether it is um uh, music or uh, playing an instrument or singing in a choir or doing plays the, the ease with which you can move into a cultural career from private school is as nothing compared to the difficulties of doing the same from a state school. It was true when I was younger, but it's much, much more true now than it was even then. So Starmer's going to be speaking about that later, a warning that arts are becoming the preserve of the elite. But in some, the reason why I preferred this conversation is because I think it speaks to very similar processes, but without necessarily that class angle, except for the fear about money. I mean, is it just now too expensive to go out? It, I, why is it that the music venues are closing, if not to be turned into flats or to be turned into shops? I, I, I genuinely don't know. The ones that I go to uh, are still there, obviously, but they're not. Not I don't go to really small ones anymore because a band's got to be fairly well known before they beep on my fifty-two-year-old radar. What do we lose? What do we lose when these places shut down? Twenty-five to one is the time. Daniel's in Seven Oaks. Daniel, what's going on? Hi, James. Right. Thanks for having me on. You're very um, welcome. <laughs> so, 
But there's a really simple angle to this that people keep on missing. And the, it, the, the issue is, is that London or, or, or the UK, it's, it, the economy of it all is an ecosystem. Yes. One will feed the other. And uh, it was only a few years ago that um, Ministry of Sound was up for, for closure for flats, uh, fabric, again, the same. Um, and the, the problem that you have is, is that the closure of the UK nightclubs then makes the UK a far less attractive proposition for university students to come over and study. Now, the, the big nightclubs that like your fabrics and your ministries and your pashas and whatever, that you, you know, pashas closed now, but those, those, those big super clubs with the big brands that, that have the, the worldwide uh, wide reputation, they're, they're all in London. Everybody knows them. So you can imagine if you're coming from a country that isn't quite right with the, uh, you know, gay rights or whatever it is that you've, the country's not got. If you're, if you're a young student and you're sort of thinking that maybe you're in the wrong body or in, you've got the wrong sexuality or whatever, you need to go and explore yourself. Yes. You do that exploration in a nightclub. Now, if you know that London's got all of the greatest nightclubs, and we do, um, and you want to go to one of the greatest universities... You, the, the combination of the nightlife and the university is an unbelievable proposition. So London's the first choice. But closing the nightclubs down, what you're doing is you're sending the traffic over to the emerging markets, uh, especially in the creative sector, and the emerging markets are Lisbon and Barcelona and Berlin. Is that right? They also, ha- yeah, yeah, and they Berlin's are, yeah. always had a banging club scene, though. Yeah, well, so Barcelona is yeah, incredible. <laughs> but we're, so, so I, I, do you know, you're describing my youth. I'd never really noted the crossover between the creativity or, 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 and, and the campuses. But, I mean, you'd even gravitate at university towards the people that you knew were going to similar clubs that you were going to. And then, then there'd be the kids there from St. Martin's. There'd be yeah, the, the, I yeah. mean, it, it was an extraordinary period. But as I said to, to Alan uh, when he was at Billy Walker's Uppercut, you don't know you're in the middle of a... A moment, do you? You don't know you're in the middle of a cultural moment. You're just out. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. Exactly that. And now we're um, we're on the. I mean, because it didn't even used to be just London. I, I mean, I mentioned the hacienda. I'm thinking of cream in Liverpool. There were international super brands at, in the northwest, certainly outside of outside yeah. of London. But you, you you obviously follow things more closely than I do. We're very much on the down slide. We're very much going. Oh, back we're on rock bottom. This really? is not good at all. Yeah, it's so you're right. If you're a of, funky young Frenchman, or a, I mean, a Scandinavian, or whatever it is, and you want to go somewhere for university, number one, we've abolished freedom of movement, which makes everything a little bit harder. <laughs> number two, tuition fees have kicked in since since I was that yeah. age. But number three is you're just not you're not hearing the mythology of nightlife coming out of London that you would have done twenty or thirty years ago. Uh, it's, yeah, precisely right. Yeah, and and the problem with that is is that when so, so for argument's sake, you're, you're from Brazil or you're from Russia or wherever it is you're, you're, you're from and, and you want to come over to study somewhere. Yeah, um, yeah. That extra, that, that extra little... And we do have an enormous amount of foreign students coming over. Like we, we, we do, um, especially from China as well. Mm. And, you know, these, the closure of those, those nightclubs, it will just make it a less attractive proposition. And then what happens is those emerging um, uh, creative markets that I've just mentioned yeah, I've will suck up our suck up our students and then all of the creativity will start gravitating over there so the next generation they, of fashion designers and musicians and, and, yes, and maybe even writers exactly. and the rest of it will be will be great i mean all we've got yes. to sell is, uh, is is the universality the commonality of the english language really but that doesn't really yeah and what we'll be left with is a load of high-rise flats in the place where the nightclubs were and you'll have the problem that you'll have won't be now the problem you'll have will be in 10 or 15 or 20 years time when the creative sector will be dwindling in the UK um, and they'll be over in those markets. Video games and developers. And, uh, well, I'm thinking of all yeah, it. What's your perspective on this? Why are you so well informed, if, if that doesn't sound patronising? No, 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 not at all. Um, so I'm a brand designer, so I went to the uh, London College of Communication, right. which had the Ministry of Sound next door right to it. Right next door, yeah. And I also design um, logos and brands for nightclubs, uh, as well so i'm, I'm so you're really close to the action worlds. really close to yeah the yeah 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 and, and the sad it. thing is it's only it's only really that 
it's only really that sort of British arrogance that holds it all together. Hmm. If you if you worked out the problem and you looked at it pragmatically, you can see how big of a problem this is coming along the horizon. And it's really sad. It is really sad. And, and the more I think about it, you mentioned the London College of Communication. I think Dazed and Confused came out of the London College of Printing. And the, the, the inex... I mean, it's absolutely impossible to separate the nightlife from the creativity. First place I ever got a byline was in a club magazine. I've, I'd forgotten about this, actually. <laughs> you just, you've just reminded me. I, I, it was rather embarrassingly for my mum, who was boasting about it in Kidderminster quite a lot when they when 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 they gave me a column. It was called G Spot Magazine, but that very much came out of the whole clubbing scene. How many journalists got their first break on 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 magazines like Dazed and Confused, and then go on to so ID the Face? All of those things had a huge huge crossover with the club scene. And if the club scene's gone, what does the what does the creativity and the cultural sector do, do. it withers, it, it, it shrinks, it dilutes, it diminishes. Daniel, that was a brilliant call. Thank you. Sarah's in Bristol. Sarah, what would you like to say? Hiya. Hello. Before I start, everything I'm saying is a personal opinion. That's Excuse always me. the same and here. It's, and it's from my personal experience. And I also go out clubbing by myself regularly. And I'm the type of person that prefers it than going out with other people. Okay. So first things first. You do not have to actually have a pure talent to get a big hit in the music industry now. Any, a YouTuber can make a song. Anyone can make If you can put yourself in a recording studio, stick it on YouTube and get enough news, you are now a musical artist. No, I'm not, I'm not completely music, stupid. I did, I did know that. Your phone line's a bit weird. I don't, has, I don't know if you've got me on speaker. If you have, can you, can you take me off it? Is that better? Yeah, always. Good. Yeah. Now that we have, not, now that there's no passion for music, there's nothing for young people to cling to. In mm. the past, when you were younger, you had your punk, you had your scar people, you yeah. had your rockers. In yeah. the 80s, you had your glam people, and they dressed like that, and they genuinely believed it. Now, when people dress or try to assimilate with the music culture, it's because it's a fashion. It's not because there's, there's no more passion in music. There's no more running down and going to that concert or being like, I really need to see that artist. It's all capitalism. And as a result of the music that's now out there, it's it's no more. You don't have any, like, a variation. You have one artist who's talking about, like, love and peace, and another one who's talking about money and, like, getting women. So there's no movements most of it, anymore, you yeah, mean? There's mo- no most movements. Of the, yeah, most of the music is all about, like, getting money, being the best, being the popular. And as a young person, we now internalize that message of, oh, we want to be the coolest, we want to be the best. So when you go out clubbing, instead of being on the middle of the dance floor and dancing and being in amongst it, you want to be in the VIP booth, you want to be in the corner taking TikTok and Snapchat. It's okay. no longer about dancing and being in the music. It's about appearing, like, social media is another thing that is ruined. Social media <laughs> has ruined how young people view dancing. So it becomes a private, it becomes a yeah, private and, experience rather than a public public experience. Yeah, and not even that. In the 90s and 80s, I'm not sure how you were on the dance floor, but I'm pretty certain you may have poured some god-awful moves. You're not you, wrong. I will, ne- I will never see that, and I will I never know seen. that. You'll never see my yeah. helicopter. My helicopter exactly. was a thing of beauty, Sarah, a thing if of I beauty. Step into, if I step into a nightclub now and do anything stupid, even walk out the club, even walk out the toilet weird, someone can record me and now I'm on TikTok and tens of thousands of people Good are laughing God. at me, Good and I'm God. now the latest meme. I can't even do a little boogie or anything. I'm always cautious that someone's watching me and someone's looking at me. There's there's so wow. much pressure on young so why do you, people why do you now. Do you do? Why, I mean, you cool. go out a lot, though, do you? On your on yeah, your yeah, I go I go I go out a lot, and I go out on my own. And the reason why I prefer going out on my own is when I go out with other people, bringing in money into this. Yes. I sometimes feel self conscious because I don't have the money to be buying five pound every time when I go buy a drink. So you're and going you're going clubbing for the same reasons that my generation did. You're going yes, clubbing to we, get out of I yourself for a while music. and you I'm, want to I'm, listen I'm to not, the music. Yeah. I'm not trying to be in that venue because no, it looks cool on TikTok. I'm not trying to wear that outfit because this is the latest trend. I'm not trying to be seen in a certain place. And even when I'm there, I don't care if someone records me because I'm, I'm, I'm doing my thing. I want to be happy. And I don't care about this image of I need to look no, cool or I you. need to be the best. Good for I you. need to be, because that young people were, filled, were so so. What was the last, we're, so, yeah. we're going to run out of time. Although to be fair, you speak so quickly. I think we've got, we've, we've managed to cram, cram in about four times as much content into this call as we do in the usual one. But what was the last, youth cultural movement then what would be the last one because because it usually like you've picked up on on a few you picked up on punk you picked up on glam the strongest rock one I can i've pick mentioned up rave on but rave was over grumpy. by the mid 90s 
So in Africa, in America, the African American culture, I want to say in the early noughties, just before Soldier Boy, just before Soldier Boy hit crank that, yeah. there was a huge culture of like crumping street, like you had your snapback, yeah. you wore your baggy yeah. trousers, and you didn't do it because everyone was doing it on TikTok. You did it because you genuinely believed because that everyone you were the was best doing crunker. it in the clubs. You genuinely messed with that music. You genuinely lim- messed with Limp Biscuit. That, like I said, you had the talented musician in place. Yeah. for you to follow and then the culture follows capitalism and social media just keep ruining the entire world well, and come I will stand on, on that. Ca- capitalism is a crucial part of the club scene but I think if you had a mic Sarah this would be the point at which you get to drop it I think 12.45 is the time that, that that's quite a bleak picture I don't know and Sarah's only 26 so I can't accuse her of this but I don't know where the line is between uh, uh, things aren't things ain't what they used to be, and a bad dose of my dayitis. But I can't imagine there are many people in their twenties listening to this and thinking, uh, "No, things are way better now than they were when O'Brien was doing his helicopter." In fact, thinking of getting filmed and becoming a meme. I went through a very ill-advised period, and I'm 99% sure that there are no photographs surviving. I, so I used to have a ponytail that looked very cool, but I went through a little period of doing something with my ponytail that my friends would fondly refer to as the pineapple. And I'm, I, I, yeah, I I mean, I'm pretty sure that I looked ridiculous. And if a photograph of that had started doing the rounds, you you could quite easily imagine becoming a a figure of fun, shall we? So I used to put my, um, I used to do the ponytail from the top of my head. God, just I'd kill to have hair like that these days. Never mind to enough to grow a ponytail, but I would have it coming out the top of my head like a like a pineapple stalk, and because it was quite curly, it would sort of it would. Do you know that's what I need to do every time I get nostalgic for the days when I had a full head of hair? I just need to remember what I looked like with a pineapple, and then suddenly it doesn't feel that bad to have lost the hair anymore. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Ben in Stafford's not happy. James, he writes, I've been listening to you for almost 10 years now, but hearing that you once had a ponytail nicknamed the pineapple is the final straw. It's only because you are the best talk show on the radio that I will stick with you. Thank you, Ben. It wasn't really nicknamed the pineapple. It just did genuinely look like a pineapple. A lot of love coming in for Sarah, the last caller, who who gets it, as you would say, um, as indeed does Bryn. I live in Sheffield, James, purely due to Gatecrasher. I met my wife there, many of my friends. If it wasn't for that super club, I would have literally led a completely different life. I'd have a different circle of friends and a different home, not to mention cultural outlook. We lose so much if we lose nightclubs and night venues. Love, friendship, life, it will always be with you, says Bryn, who is thinking of those lasers that we were all reaching for. They were days, weren't they? They really were. I'm in Sheffield soon doing a gig, actually. I must remember to give you some of the details. Um, It's also been pointed out to me that for some younger listeners, the phrase doing the helicopter may have a rather different meaning. To to be clear, it was the way in which I used to wave my arms around that that prompted us to... I I could clear it. I mean, it was madness, actually. But that is what Sarah was touching on. What's that word? It's inhibition, isn't it? You, you Absolute absence of inhibition. I wonder whether young people today ever have that. And it doesn't matter whether you're on drugs or not. I mean, an absence of inhibition. I wonder the way she talked about being constantly fearful of, or A, trying to look good for your own socials, and B, being fearful of looking bad on other people's socials. Word monoculture is one that the producer used. It breeds a monoculture. It breeds a... Where, where, where there's no... There are no grey areas, there's no margins, there's no cultural hedgerows. We're all in the same massive field. It's quite a poetic way of putting it, isn't it? You can tell I did a lot of clubbing in my youth. 12.52 is the time. In fact, I did quite a lot of clubbing in a massive field. Uh, Lawrence is in Wandsworth. Lawrence, what would you like to say? Hello, Jane. How are you? Very well. What's on your mind? Good. Um, I'm 27 this year, and uh, so I've been clubbing for maybe 10 11 years, perhaps, maybe before the, uh, the government would prefer me to go clubbing. Yes. Um, and uh, I just think that the biggest driver from putting people, young people away, usually students, yeah. is just the toss. So when I was 18, 19, and I was living in Brighton, yeah. um, on a Thursday night, for example, you would be able to go to the nightclub and it would be a pound for a drink, you know, a pound for a be literally a pound for a bottle of beer or like a vodka lemonade and that's really accessible for students who so are... It's a student. Stu- I mean, it's a student loads of money. market. Student market. Student yeah, so, night. Yeah, yeah. And it was a student night, yeah. And But now, I just went out this weekend in the local club in Clapham um, and 
I'm looking at, I'm going to buy like three or four ciders or whatever for a round of drinks from mates. And I'm looking at them, tossing up the, t- the total one there too. And I'm like, geez, this is, this is actually coming out of reach even for me. And then I look back at my bank statement and I'm like, this is now turning into a once a month thing. Right. So, so just no prohibitively one, no expensive. No cost these places are frozen down because people just can't really afford to. Cost of living, wages. I mean, we're back to the same territory that we explore quite often on this programme, although probably not realising that it applies to nightclubs as keenly as it applies to other areas. So you, you simply, your wages haven't kept up with the cost of living. And, therefore, oh. and also it's not as much fun or any fun to go out unless you can have a couple of rounds of drinks with your mates. Exactly, yeah. and then when the shots start pouring and things like that, it just the cost comes up, and it's not like I'm, you know, I don't, I'm not on like a minimum minimum wage job or whatever, and but it's still, it's still like becoming a bit out of reach now. I would say. What What about the sure. price of entry? If that doesn't make me sound like a complete geriatric, what's the price of entry for a club like the one you were well, at? The one that I go to. Uh, it's free before nine or ten, but oh, then okay. depending, depending on the night, it can be. Five, but then six, it's pub prices. Down. There's no such thing as a student night in in Clapham. There might be elsewhere in London. I don't know, but that that, that that's what gets you in. I can't, I mean, thank you, Lawrence. I mean, in some ways, it's encouraging to know that twenty seven year olds are still at it. But I tell you what, I am surprised by how many people have picked up on Sarah's point about going viral. Jazz says we're constantly fearful of ending up going viral after being posted on someone else's TikTok and having thousands of people laugh at us. One hundred percent and aid says james why don't you mention the ecstasy let's be honest this was a big part of the experience well maybe for that era aid and maybe for you but not not for when alan was at the uppercut uh, 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 you know in north london or when other people were at jilly's rock world the rave scene i suppose had quite a lot of drugs going on with it but it it, it wasn't the case 10 years later or 10 years previously so I don't know that it is necessarily an integral. Um, and I'm very sorry, Annette, that I wasn't referring to the breakdance move, the helicopter. Because, I, I mean, could you imagine it? When you do it on your head and your legs become the blades, I, I, A, I don't think you could have done that in the kind of clubs I was going to. Your head would have stuck to the floor. And, and, and B, um, a, a hugely, hugely lacking in the coordination needed even to contemplate such a move. L- L- Carl's in Enfield. Carl, what made you pick up the phone? Um, hi, James. Hello. I'd like to start by thanking you for being a shining light of perspective and sanity. Well, that's very decent <laughs> in, of you. Thank in you. This, uh, ever, ever more challenging world. It? Um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm a working musician. We're based in North London. I'm one of the co-founders of the theatre show Stomp. Oh, cool. And, that's brilliant. Um, thank you. And yeah, I'm just adding, according to add my observations, really, in terms of my experience uh, um, over the past kind of decade or so, over the course of which our industry and what we do has been serially battered, underfunded yeah. and undervalued by our Tory friends. Um, what are know, we going to uh, lose? What are we going to lose? Could, 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 I mean, will there be another stomp out there that's never going to see the light of day because the environments in which it was gestated have never um, don't exist anymore. Quite possibly, that that is a danger. What what we will lose is is the very antidote to the increasing problems that that we are facing today. You yes. know, we we need this this outlet. We need music. We need the arts. We you know, as opposed to Sunak's insistence on on the importance of maths. <laughs> you know, right. really so I'm not here to defend the prime minister, but it's not either or. I'm pretty sure. Well, I mean, you can do maths and go clubbing, but I take your point. It's a question of what. His priorities are and it's unlikely it's, to be it's, nightclubs it's priorities you know and we're the ones that have been serious seriously battered over the over the course of the past few years you know there are there are so many 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 causes here yeah. from you know as your previous callers have stated from especially affordability i mean we've experienced you know catastrophes you know a series of catastrophes from covid to brexit Yes. Cost of living now, you know, all of which have, have conspired to 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 put us down. I am currently in the process of being evicted from my flat um, and can no longer afford to live in the London area. Oh, no. I don't go. I think people don't don't go out because they can't afford it. I have a very good old friend who manages a small independent um, venue in Brighton called Verdict Jazz Club. Yeah. Who he's done, um, 
um, fantastic work in getting it back up on its feet after COVID. However, they're still crowdfunding despite regularly selling out um, as a small venue. That's, that's when the terror. I'm going. We're going to run out of time. That's that's when the terror strikes, isn't it? When you're doing because actually. Of all the costs. Yeah, because of the energy cost, the cost of living. So you're actually doing your bit of the bargain, but it's not enough to stay afloat, which is, you know, historically where conversations, if you thought Carl was being a bit previous, bringing politics into it, that's literally where conversations about subsidies and state support kick in. So if only to see you through the tough times so that you're still in business when the tide comes back in again. Carl, a lot of love for Stomp coming in. Stephen and Milton Keynes seen it twice. Got goosebumps both times and many people will be... Very sad to learn that, that even even a success like that isn't enough to insulate you from the vagaries of the current economic situation. We'll talk again, I hope. If you missed any of today's show, um, it, you can listen back. I think our greeting of 30p Lee's infection to the Reform UK company was probably worth another listen, at least. Uh, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, Lewis Goodall is standing in for Tom Swarbrick, who's standing in for Nick Ferrari this week. But now it's time for Sheila Fogarty, who stands in for no one. James O'Brien on LBC.